pray for y'all. All right, everyone, we're, we're going we're to start in about two minutes. For, for, the, for those uh, on live stream, uh, we appreciate um, you being here and uh, your patience. All right, why don't we go ahead and begin. Uh, good morning uh, to those of you uh, who are here. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, um, wherever you are, uh, to our friends joining us uh, from the live stream. Uh, my name is Andy Grotto. I direct the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance uh, here at Stanford University, where I'm also a William J. Perry Secu uh, International Security Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. This is day two of our one and a half day workshop on the geopolitics of technology in East Asia. Um, yesterday, uh, we, uh, we had um, a terrific uh, lineup of panels uh, and discussions, um, including uh, opening remarks from uh, President Gwyn Lee from the Korea Foundation, uh, a panel on semiconductor supply chain resilience uh, with Bruce Andrews from Intel, Claire Sanderson uh, from TSMC, uh, Miriam Cope from ASML, um, we had um, a presentation uh, from Rob Atkinson of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation on new challenges and opportunities for Korean uh, science and technology policy. Um, we had a conversation uh, with Ambassador Suk Young Choi uh, from Korea on the geopolitics of digital governance and trade, uh, China, Korea, and the United States. Uh, we had a, a, a lively conversation about um, export controls and other um, um, measures, uh, economic measures designed to, to, to address national security risks uh, with Emily Weinstein fr uh, from, from Georgetown, Kevin Wolf uh, from Aiken Gump, uh, and uh, Megan Stiefel from uh, the Institute for Security and Technology. Um, we, have, we have a really excellent lineup of panels today as well. Um, if you missed the panels yesterday, you could find them um, on, 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 I believe it's our, our YouTube channel. Um, same, same place where you are now, um, and I, I urge you to go back and um, take a look at those if, if, if you weren't able to join us yesterday. Um, today we have, we'll start with um, a presentation uh, and discussion on a paper that uh, my colleague Sherry Park and I um, are releasing today uh, entitled The Silicon Allies Achieving Allied Resiliency Against Threats to the Semiconductor Supply Chain. Uh, from there, um, we'll have a conversation um, with Professor Sung, uh, Sung Wok Hyo from uh, Korea, from the Seoul National University uh, Law School, um, along with Matt Sheehan from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We'll also be joined by Daniel Zhang from Stanford's um, Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, after that, um, we'll have a short break, and then we'll return uh, for a conversation uh, with Professor Ji Wook Shin uh, and Professor H.S. Philip Wong on human capital. Uh, and the innovation workforce. Um, so with that, let me invite um, 
Sherry Park to uh, the podium. Um, Sherry um, is going to uh, uh, brief you on um, our paper uh, on, on semiconductor resilience. Uh, Sherry is pursuing a master's degree in international policy at Stanford uh, with a concentration in cyber policy and security, uh, fluent in Korean, English, Japanese, and Mandarin. Uh, Sherry is interested um, in technology, in diplomacy, um, and uh, cyber policy, global cooperation, online platforms. Um, she is on leave uh, from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, in South Korea, where she's a foreign service officer. Um, and um, she uh, worked uh, in that capacity with multilateral groups um, such as MICTA, the Mexico, Indonesia, uh, Korea, Turkey, Australia group, uh, the D10 Strategic Forum, and the Visegrad group, the V4. Um, it is, I'm gonna ask her to come up and jump, uh, we can, we can uh, talk, go through the paper. We'll, uh, she'll brief the paper and then uh, there'll be a period for Q&A. Uh, we'll, we look forward to your uh, comments, uh, questions, and feedback. And ju just as a, um, a housekeeping note, um, I wanna emphasize that uh, the views in the paper uh, are just uh, Sherry and mine. They don't reflect the views of any, any government, um, anybody else other than the two of us. Uh, so with that, Sherry, uh, I invite you up. Hello, um, my name is Sherry Park and I'm a master's student at Stanford, but I'm also um, a research assistant for Professor Goro. Um, I'll make my presentation on Professor Goro and my research on how the US and its allies um, should work together to achieve allied resilience in the semiconductor supply chain. Um, my presentation will follow the order of the overview, uh, where I'll talk about our research objectives and initial thoughts, um, followed by the recommendations and future research ideas. Um, and I'll go right into my presentation. Um, for the purpose of our research, we focused on a few countries and named it um, the Silicon Allies, which includes the European Union and its member states, Japan, Korea, um, Taiwan and the U.S. Um, there are several reasons why we chose these countries. Um, first is their presence in the supply chain. Nearly half of the links in the supply chain um, are concentrated among the Silicon Allies and China. And these countries altogether comprise 99% of the value chain for semiconductors, um, as well as 56% of the world GDP um, and 78% of the market for finished semiconductors. Also, um, the Silicon Allies are um, liberal democracies, um, with the U.S. serving as the center for the links um, that bonds them together as political and economic partners. So when we started on looking into the semiconductor industry and the supply chain, we saw a lot of narratives um, in the U.S. and in other countries um, that they need to support their domestic industries and they need to um, build self-sufficient supply chain. Um, the semiconductor supply chain is global, and different countries play different roles in the supply chain. U.S. leads um, in design. Um, Korea and Taiwan is known for their manufacturing capabilities. ASML, um, which is a country, uh, sorry, um, which is a company that belongs to the Netherlands, is, leads the most advanced lithography machinery um, company. Um, they are interdependent, and this structure has been built over several decades, and we wouldn't say achieving self-sufficient supply chain is impossible, but it wouldn't be very achievable at an acceptable cost. According to a study, um, they will need around one trillion US dollar worth of initial investment with additional tens of billions of US dollars annually to sustain this investment to build a self-sufficient supply chain over the world. As a result of the increase in cost, um, the price of semiconductors will increase as well by 35 to 65%. So Silicon allies are also aware of this fact and that interdependency cannot easily be overcome within a foreseeable future. And they're trying to figure out ways 
to integrate multilateral elements to their resilience initiatives. So the Silicon allies have been um, talking about this multilateral cooperation, and then um, they have written and flagged this factor into their strategies and public statements. The U.S. is seeking various ways to find ways to build resilience with um, its partners in the global semiconductor supply chain. Korea and Taiwan started their bilateral collaboration with the U.S. Um, focused on semiconductors specifically. And Japan and EU, they have emphasized this multilateral cooperation factor into their semiconductor strategy. However, even for these efforts, um, they have achieved um, a little so far. This is, um, all, this is um, because it's in early stage, but another factor would be because there are conflicting factors between the allies that rises from this interdependence that also works as hindrance to their collaboration. So we, ident so we ident identified the three policy challenges that come from interdependency. First um, is the asymmetric interdependencies. When a country can hold a supply chain hostage by interfering with the links in the supply chain, and when that country, without feeling an equal or even greater amount of pain in itself, we, say, we can say that this asymmetric interdependency works in that country's favor. Um, these, um, the, the asymmetric interdependency arises from um, choke points in the supply chain, um, technologies that are highly advanced than others. And we can also think about the trade volume. For example, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. For these countries, China is their biggest um, bilateral trading partner. Whereas for China, um, there, it's not true. Trade with these three countries make up such much um, smaller portion of its total trade. The bilateral trade relationship, we can say, is, in a, is asymmetric in China's favor. Next is manufacturing capacity races among national strategies. Here we are talking about um, the fab specifically. Silicon allies want companies to build their fabs in their countries and want more manufacturing capacity compared to their peers. However, even with the semiconductor shortage that we are seeing right now, um, the projected demand for chips is not infinite. The Silicon allies, in the end, are competing for a limited market where the level of state support determines which of the allies wins. And finally, um, the third policy challenge that we can think about is the tensions between the, um, the security and economic interests. The Silicon allies have different relationships with China, and some countries have legacy investments and manufacturing operations in China. Um, Korea, for example, Samsung has 42% of their NAND flash um, outputs that come from um, chi Chinese-based facilities, and for SK Hynix, they have um, a facility in Wuxi, which um, produces 47% of the, their DRAM chip outputs. So this means that um, Korea's relationship with China cannot just be disregarded, meaning China is important for Korea in terms of their short-term economic interests. However, this, com this conflicts with um, the collaboration in terms of Silicon allies, as this clashes with Silicon allies' security interests. This becomes even obvious with the leading edge semiconductors. They are integral to the high-end applications, such as AI, um, virtual realities, um, autonomous systems. And these, cheap, these chips, unlike um, the commodity chips, may contribute to um, a country's military power. And this will have even bigger security concerns. So again, to overcome um, or even at least mitigate these policy challenges, the Silicon allies Need to, share, need to have a shared vision to orient and guide their initiatives so that they do not undermine um, their shared resiliency goals. Um, now for the policy recommendations. So we laid out several factors here that Silicon allies should keep in mind 
when coming up with their collaborative strategies. Here we did not go into detail to provide guidelines for how the policies should look like. This is because there are already so many ideas out there about what needs to be done. There are talks about export controls, there are talks about building more fabs. Um, people say workforce challenge is the thing that we should work on, but they do not really have the core concept that will bond these separate um, strategies together. So the core concept, um, Professor Gordo um, refers to these as recipes to the ingredients, um, which I really like. So the recipes that we have come up with are as follows. Um, first key factor is trust. Trust will bond these allies together even at the challenges posed by different interests and dynamics that collide in undesired ways. There is competition among the allies as we've seen in the manufacturing capacity race. Um, the bilateral fl frictions as seen um, between Korea and Japan. Uh, we know that Japan excluded Korea from its export flight list. And seems exist among the multilateral channels for engagement on strategic matters um, generally and on semiconductor resiliency matters specifically. There are um, usually bilateral or limited multilateral channels. And when it comes to multilateral channels, um, their agenda are a bit too narrow to talk about these things together. And of course, um, their stance toward China is very different. Therefore, we need trust as foundation for silicon allies. This is because there um, will be collaborative efforts, but at the same time, there will also be national initiatives that they will be pursuing for their own resiliency. There will be mixed nuances that come from this individual efforts to build resiliency. And to shed away the suspicion, we need trust. To achieve trust, we need transparency. The transparency about their um, national resilience initiatives. The allies should exchange information. They should share the ends and means of their semiconductor resilience and also talk about what forms of state support there will be um, and what funding and how much funding there will be um, in line with this um, initiative. The goal of sharing um, this information is to develop a common operating picture so that we are aware of the threats and potential risk in the supply chain. We'll talk about the critical dependencies um, and the relevant market and um, policy conditions. During the Trade and um, Technology Council meeting last weekend, um, they talked about the early warning system so that we can better predict and address potential disruptions in the supply chain. This will um, ensure that there is security in supply and also that we can avoid subsidy raise. And, mm, sorry. and we think this is in line with what we are trying to picture here, that we are trying to develop a common operating picture. And last um, recipe would be the engagement. There are several mechanisms in this, um, that Silicon allies can use to facilitate such an exchange, including bilateral and multilateral engagements. However, as I mentioned, um, there are limited, limited um, multilateral engagement channels that we can um, facilitate. So we hope the US can take a lead as it is the strongest node among the allies that can link these um, different countries together. And through these exchanges, we hope that this would reduce the chan um, chances of misperception and um, misunderstandings about the ends and means of the national initiatives. Um, this will also reduce the chances that the allies um, separate national resilience um, initiative, distort the competition. And in this engagement process, we hope that national legislator, legis legislatures um, must be part of this engagement. This is due to their roles in policymaking. They talk and decide the budget. Um, they are the bodies where arguments about the means and ends of policies are discussed and announced. And this potentially gives rise to misperceptions about the dominant drivers. So having them in this engagement process would really help um, engage and build trust. Moreover, uh, we, we think that collaborative work on future challenges would also be really helpful. 
um, workforce challenge is a problem, for example, that semiconductor manufacturers are facing. They'll benefit, um, so solving this problem will benefit most of the um, countries and industries if this problem is solved. There's already lack of talents coming into semiconductor industry, and countries are coming up with different strategies for that cause. So with the projected growth in the semiconductor industry, um, discussing workforce challenges and ways to overcome that problem right now will bring productive engagement between the countries and the allies. Um, this brings me to the last portion of my presentation. So we outlined several key factors that we should bear in mind when coming up with policies for allied resiliency um, in the supply chain. But there needs to be more detailed action plans. Um, so we would need to think about the principles. When we play a game, um, there needs to be a rule that is agreed by all the players so that we can continue to play the game. Just like that, for the allies to continue their collaboration, we need principles, the rules, um, that silicon allies could follow to mitigate the policy challenges. And next is the engagement. We know that engagement is needed, but how uh, will it be structured so that it does not conflict with the silicon allies' different levels of economic and political relationships with China? Um, we need to think about that issue for more collaborative effort. And finally, uh, we need to think in a broader picture. Uh, we for this research purpose, we've confined to silicon allies in this research. Um, but there are more countries out there um, leaving footprints in the supply chain, and we need to think what countries should be consulted or even included in this effort. And we know that there definitely will be more questions to be answered um, for future research, but these three questions were the very next step that we thought um, should be clarified so that we can build a more resilient global semiconductor supply chain. Um, and <laughs> this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, so uh, we would love to hear uh, your questions, your comments. If you want, you can, I, think, I think that microphone will work too, sure. If you want to have a seat, we can. Um, so, um, Maria, why don't you start us off? Oh, we're getting a mic, so hang, hang tight one second. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Anna Maria from, um, from uh, Taltic University in Estonia, currently the Global Digital Governance Fellow uh, with Andy. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, congratulations to both on the publication. I think the topic is very important, very timely. Um, and I think the way you have framed this by bringing out the challenges and offering policy solutions is, is a great way to kind of, uh, take this discussion further because on the international level, on regional levels, there is a lot of talk on, on supply, supply chain security and clearly it is a very challenging is issue. And one of the topics that you uh, very rightly bring out as being the challenge is, is transparency and trust. I completely agree this is the key issue here. Um, my question is, um, how would, um, what do you see as, as the main kind of paths forward? Um, you mentioned some in this trust issue, because I ask this from the EU perspective. Trust is a key issue also among the EU members, and it's not easy. Uh, you mentioned here challenging, uh, um, exchanging information. Even among EU members, which you might expect, oh, we have, uh, you know, a shared vision uh, and, and all these regulatory frameworks and a shared understanding, shared perspectives, it is very difficult to share information, especially when it comes to more delicate issues regarding security. So um, if considering that you have this sort of, what I can't call it fragmentation, but differences in understandings already within the EU, and then what you propose here is with the Silicon Valley is to have the, the more broader cooperation, which I agree is what you need to solve this issue. How do you, how do you want to overcome uh, this challenge? Because first you have different views within the EU and clearly between the EU and the US already on sharing information. So, so what do you think is the best way forward, uh, taking into account uh, the recent developments and, and, and you have lots of experience in, in these privacy issues between EU and, and the states? 
So I would like to hear your, uh, your views on this. Thanks. Great. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think um, part of the answer lies in um, what the, 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 the US and the EU were able to accomplish over the weekend um, in the Trade and Technology Council, where one of the, um, one of the outcomes uh, Sherry referenced is a commitment to share more information about, um, about uh, the supply chain uh, with an eye towards um, uh, reducing the risk of future disruptions and shortages. Um, I, I think that's a really important step. Um, I think, um, but that's just, you know, that's just uh, one actor, right? Two actors, you know, the US and, and, and the EU. I think it was um, Kissinger used to joke, you know, who do, I, who do I call when I want to phone Europe? Well, actually, you know, when it comes to the TTC, we actually, th th there's a mechanism to deal with that. Now the question is, okay, who do I call when I want to connect with the Silicon Allies? Where, if you look in Asia, the existing bilateral and multilateral mechanisms create this kind of Venn diagram of overlap, but without any one of those mechanisms capturing all, all, the, all the important players. And so um, we, in the paper, you know, we, um, we express a, a, a preference for pursuing, tr trying to develop a, multi, a more multi inclusive multilateral uh, approach. Um, there are a lot of challenges with doing that. Um, not least of which is Taiwan and its, its status. Um, but I, I do think there are plenty of ways to, to finesse that issue. And um, so we, I'm just, a, you know, so you, the Europeans have, we have the, the TTC with the Europeans. Um, there are bilateral um, engagements with Korea, with Japan, with Taiwan. There are bilateral, you know, engagements between Taiwan and Japan. Uh, there are bilateral uh, engagements with Korea and Taiwan, and then friction, <laughs> you know, between Korea and Japan. Um, there are, you know, initiatives like the Quad that capture um, s s two of them, <laughs> you know, but not all of them. Um, you know, and in Korea debates, you know, whether whether it would would join the Quad or not. Uh, and so none of the existing, in, you know, sort of institutions really capture the collection, and I think that that's a key. When we refer to seams in, in, in the architecture, uh, that's what we mean, and that, that's a big problem. Um, again, so our, our bias would be to, to try to build towards um, some mechanism that can capture all, all of these different groups. Um, you know, export controls, uh, it's an imperfect analogy, but um, export controls emerge in kind of a similar way where you have a group of like-minded countries come together, and, and over time, um, it begins to kind of crystallize into something uh, more enduring, more institutionalized. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, m m maybe there's, you know, maybe there's a soul group, right, uh, you know, that becomes, uh, you know, a um, um, sort of the name for, 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 this, for this group. Um, um, but, I, but I do think there's, there's, there's a real need there. And, and getting to trust will require some form of institutionalized um, engagement. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I agree with what um, Professor Grotto just mentioned, and I also maybe I could add one more one more portion to it. Um, I would say we need to be patient um, because trust, all these factors, cannot just be built overnight. Um, one of my best friends um, is from Estonia, um, but because of the cultural differences, we weren't really, you know, sharing a lot of things together in the initial stage. But you know, over time, after two years of study together here at Stanford, we are like one of the best friends when we share our difficulties. And we hope to see that um, between the countries as well. So this is not just about um, you know, specific sectors, like what are we going to do. It's not just about like, specific like, strategies. It's about building trust. That's what we are trying to convey um, through this paper. I think Ambassador, go ahead. Yeah. Um I, I have one. Uh, does it work? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, I have one comment, uh, actually. Uh, also, I, I would like to add uh, also the comments to your question on uh, regarding the trust, uh, how to building the trust. Um, and I have a question, actually. Um, regarding the trust building, uh, it is not easy. Uh, uh, 
how, whether and how we can uh, verify uh, whether our partner is really trustworthy or not. Yeah? Uh, actually, uh, the credible verification uh, system should be provided in order to keep uh, the trust. The number one principle is transparency. If a reliable transparency rule would be provided, I mean, that is the first step to verify uh, the trustworthiness. And second, uh, agreed uh, rules, I mean the institutions actually, agreed rules among participating members could be made, then actually we can, uh, we can trust each other to some extent. And lastly, um, if the, in case the trust would be broken, credible punishment mechanism should be provided. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee, actually, the, the trust questions at the end of the day. Therefore, therefore the multilateral approach uh, is easy to speak, but um, to make an agreement is not an easy task, actually. You just uh, uh, provided a concept and thought and ideas, but a real, uh, actually, cooking a meal is not, not that much easy, actually. It's, uh, it's the job of the government officers uh, to reach agreement. And that is my comment. Uh, question. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cherry, for comprehensive study uh, supply chains of semiconductors. My, my question is uh, whether you have studied, actually, uh, now, actually, you uh, studied uh, from uh, design stage of the semiconductor and the production uh, distribution and the final consumption stage. Well, I would like to ask you whether you have studied even before the de design stage, for example, uh, where to get uh, the ingredient of semiconductor, for example, rare earths, are uh, also distributed for, uh, actually in, in many other countries, including China or other countries. Uh, even if you would build up a semiconductor alliance among trust, trusted partners, if you would not get uh, the essential element uh, uh, producing, producing semiconductor, actually, you cannot guarantee actually the credible uh, supply chains of semiconductor. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, first of all, thank you so much, Ambassador, for your comments. I believe they are all really um, valuable feedbacks. Um, and for the ingredients, uh, we, so when we did our research, um, with prof I, when Professor and I did the research, actually we first looked into the individual policies that each country have. Um, so like Korea, Taiwan, um, EU, and Japan, like even China, US, we all looked at if the individual countries and saw what kind of strategies they have. And they all have like export controls, they have like thoughts about how to um, have talents coming into this field, but all these um, strategies, as we mentioned in the, re um, as I mentioned in this presentation as, and in the paper, um, there aren't really the ingredient, the recipes that bond these strategies together. And I know, and as you mentioned, that um, finding the right ingredients is really hard, but we believe through these recipes and by building trust, um, we would be able to find the right ingredients and be able to kind of talk about it in the multilateral cooperation um, platform and come up with um, the right re ingredients in the end, hopefully. And I'll, I'll add, I think, so, so last year, um, the Department of Commerce um, issued a, um, a request uh, for information from the semiconductor industry on supply chain issues. Um, and that, that yielded a lot of, you know, sort of insight into um, where uh, there may be choke points, whether it's rare earths, other, you know, inputs, you know, palladium, neon, you know. Um, and th this, this initiative that, um, that the U.S. and the EU announced um, to, to share data on the supply chain, I think, will, will help map out where some of these, um, these dependencies lie. Um, I think what, what, what sort of has fascinated me about this topic is this is not the first time we've experienced semiconductor shortages. I mean, they, they, they occur 
uh, you know, uh, they've occurred many times over the past few decades um, as a result of natural disasters, um, you know, and other, other actions, um, actions by, by, by governments. And I think to us, I mean, it, it just, it speaks to a, um, just a fundamental problem in um, projecting um, the future, <laughs> which is which is hard, um, but being able to manage risk at least uh, that that's more achievable. And managing supply chain risk starts with kind of understanding the supply chain and um, being in a position to identify single points of failure. For example, um, I, th I think it was you yesterday, Ambassador, who mentioned the uh, or maybe it was President Lee. Uh, the uh, the component in Ukraine in automobiles, the fifty cent component, the wiring harness that um, you know that uh, was the supply was disrupted because of Russia's war on Ukraine, and now German automakers are facing a real uh, problem in producing cars just because of this fifty cent component. Um, and that same challenge, you know, is is is, is present in, in 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 semiconductors, and so. Um, I think transparency will help the allies identify where these choke points exist. Um, in some cases, um, you know, it, it may be a matter of, of, of you know, directing investment, whether that's Chips Act funding, uh, other 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 government funding to develop an alternative supply. If if you know the risk is so high that um, you know that it merits that level of investment. In other cases, um, just the fact that you have you know the allies a lot allied on 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 uh, semiconductors could actually be a bit of a hedge against a state um, holding that input hostage um, because they 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 know that um, they won't just be injuring uh, one country uh, they will you know affect the ecosystem at large and, and may suffer um, a consequence. To your point about consequences. Hi, uh, thanks very much, Sherry and Professor Grotto. Uh, I'm Mick, I'm also a Master of International Policy candidate uh, together with Sherry uh, at Stanford. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks very much for the presentation. And uh, uh, last year I did a project also on semiconductors, looking at the US national uh, strategy for semiconductors from the perspective of technology and, and national security. And, uh, you know, we also talked a lot about uh, everyone's sort of desire to build more fabs and bring production back to the US. However, uh, we identified one of the key uh, concerns or uh, things that most people don't think about as education and uh, sort of pipeline that you mentioned in, in one of the slides. And uh, you know, we have uh, companies like TSMC who are educating uh, uh, engineers in, in ASU right now. And, and you know, there are these kind of uh, projects that are attempting to target this problem uh, there is not enough uh, talent going into semiconductors, and not enough people being interested in the hardware because you know software is is a lot more sexier. It's it's something that you know brings you fast money. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any like state level initiatives, also perhaps originating from Korea or Japan, that you have uh, come across, and and if so, you know are they any different from what TSMC is doing? And, and you know should it be a company driven thing or should it be something that the silicon allies should be uh, looking at together to make sure that there are enough people uh, working on these fabs and you know coming up with innovation. Thank you. I love the question. It's a great question, um, and um, my my short answer is to stick around for our panel later today with Professor Wong and Professor Shin because we're 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 we're, 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 we're going to dive into that topic. Um, I think. Um, just the longer answer, at least at least for, for our, our present discussion, is um, sh yes. I, I mean, I, there, 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 I think there are plenty of opportunities for, um, for multilateral engagement on workforce issues, um, ranging from you know, visa policy to um, you know, STEM educational uh, partnerships. E even even um, R you know, R&D initiatives. There's a, uh, a multilateral uh, semiconductor resilience provision um, in the CHIPS Act, um, I, and I forget, it's either in the Senate version or the House version, I forget which, which version it's in, but it's in, it's in one of them. Uh, and that legislation is going through conference now, and my hope is that that provision survives that negotiation, and if it does, um, that could be um, used, I think, potentially to, um, to help uh, bolster the, the supply chain. 
extra element? Um, yeah, maybe I could add one more element. So like in Korea and Taiwan, they're building um, new like majors in universities that like that are specifically um, focused on semiconductors and like um, works that will um, contribute to semiconductor industry and also like providing scholarships and providing like um, aligned um, process for you know those major graduates to get right into work and like you know um, yeah and they they are all in place it's just that there there aren't really collaborative work there. Yeah, are we on time? Um, I think we're actually at. Uh, just at the end of our appointed time um, for this session, uh, we have a break um, coming up here. Let me just review my schedule here real fast. Um, make sure I'm not messing up. Ah, actually, uh, no, we're, we're, we are now going to go into um, a conversation about governing AI. So we will... Uh, transition the panel, and uh, please join me in thanking Sherry for her presentation. Um, uh, we, we welcome feedback on the paper. Um, you know, we, we, we released the paper today, but, um, you know, we view these, these documents as living documents and are open to, to feedback, and especially as we refine and identify next steps in, in our work. Um, so let me now invite um, uh, Professor Hyo up to the podium. Um, and if, uh, I'm going to also ask uh, Daniel Zhang from the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute to join us, and then we will have Matt Sheehan uh, from the Carnegie Endowment join us through uh, the magic of Zoom. So Professor, if you want to have a seat. Um, so for our next uh, discussion, um, and let's see if we could get um, Matt, um, there he is. Hi, Matt, how are you? Um, so let me begin with some, some, some introductions. Um, uh, I'll start with, um, with, with Professor Hyo, is a public law professor at Seoul National uh, University Law School, uh, where he teaches administrative law, uh, environmental law, and law and economics. Uh, he, re he received his PhD in law and LLM degree from Seoul National University Graduate School and his bachelor's degree um, in economics from Seoul uh, National University Economics Department. Um, he's interested in um, uh, economic regulation um, with um, using the analytic tools of economics. Um, and uh, recently, um, he's uh, devoted a lot of time and energy to the field of AI ethics and law climate change and energy law, food safety law, IT and privacy law, and the judicial system. Um, he also participated in the process of framing uh, Korea's Green Growth Act um, and its uh, Emission Trade Act and revision of the data protection law in Korea, um, which um, is, is, is unique in the world in that it is one of the few uh, uh, laws that I believe is, is uh, receiving adequacy determination uh, from the European Commission uh, for the purposes of GDPR. Uh, um, before joining um, the law school uh, in 2006, uh, he was a judge in um, the Seoul Central District Court in Korea uh, and um, presiding judge of a specialized panel uh, for intellectual property law cases. Um, uh, he, this is not his first time on Stanford's campus. Um, we've had the pleasure of having him here uh, several times, including uh, as a visiting scholar um, at um, APARC, the Asia Pacific Research Center, uh, from, from uh, August 2010 uh, to August in 2011. Um, next up, um, we have um, Daniel Zhang. Uh, Daniel um, is, a, um, is with uh, Stanford's um, Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute um, and the author um, of um, a, a new report that um, we'll have an opportunity to talk about. Uh, that examines uh, the case for a multilateral artificial intelligence um, research institute 
Um, he's also uh, a contributor to Stanford to, to, to HIES. That's the acronym for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence here at Stanford. Stanford HIES uh, AI Index. Um, and uh, before uh, coming to Stanford, he worked on global AI talent flows and security risks at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. Um, uh, he holds an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown, um, where he concentrated on tech policy and international security. Uh, and he received his BA in politics um, and international affairs uh, from Furman University. And then uh, joining us um, through the power of Zoom is Matt Sheehan. Uh, Matt is a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, where his research focuses on global technology issues with a specialization in China's artificial intelligence ecosystem. Uh, Matt is the author of The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future, published by Counterpoint Press in 2019. Matt lived in China, worked in China from 2010 uh, through 2016, uh, where among other things, he was the first uh, China correspondent uh, for uh, the World Post. Um, he's, his writing's been published by The Atlantic, Bloomberg, Vice, Wired, um, and uh, we're really excited uh, to have him uh, join us today for this conversation on, on AI governance. Um, so let me, let me start. Um, I want to start with Professor Hyo. Um, could you, could you kind of give us um, a, an overview of, of sort of where the debate is in Korea on AI policy and law? Um, thank you, Groto. So before going into my answer, so uh, let me say my so, um, gratitude for this wonderful invitation. So, and I'm very honored to uh, join this phenomenal event. Um, so uh, the topic of, of this, this session panel is the, um, the how to gov govern AI or, or list uh, related to uh, AI utilization. So um, first of all, so my, my, my feeling and understanding is that why we are so much worried about this kind of new, uh, new AI issues. So because the, to the topic is the, uh, the governing of AI, but I feel that many people, including growth, um, are very much worried about in the near future, we might be uh, governed by AI, so not, not <laughs> governing AI anymore. So uh, maybe that might be the uh, starting point of our discussion. So uh, on, on, top, on, on that background, so let me go some, some short introduction to the Korean um, dialogue on AI policy and regulation. So this is kind of the, the boring part might be. So, uh, like many other countries, like EU or United States, so the Korean government and the societies has been much um, thinking or, or having discussions about how to govern AI or how to making some standard of AI ethics and, and regulation, etc. So, with that, in the year of 2020, so uh, in December, so the government uh, proposed how to say. Um, the uh, the uh, AI ethics for for humans enter the AI. So um, this is based composed of three principles. So which is like the principle of the human dignity, and second the principle principle of public goods, and third the principle of how to say the purposeness of uh, AI technology. So under these three main principles. So this is quite abstract and vague, but the, uh, they provided 10 um, key factors of yeah, uh, requirement for AI technology. So the first one is the protection of human rights, and second one is the protection of privacy, and the third one is the respect for diversity, and fourth one is the prevention of harmfulness, and fifth one, uh, publicness, and the sixth one uh, is the solidarity. And seventh one, so the management of data. And the eighth one is the accountability. And ninth one is um, security or, or safety. The tenth one is the transparency. And we are all familiar with these key factors because these are so commonly um, discussed in EU or, or United States versions. 
So this was the, the, the first stage of Korean government, maybe first official suggestion for AI ethics um, standard. So on this background, so in the year of 2021, May, so Korean government also provided um, so called, so this is not, this is provided only in Korea, so let me, so this is the uh, AI strategic plan for trustworthy uh, AI. Uh, for uh, human-centered um, technology. So, so this is basically a strategic plan based upon that uh, human-centered uh, AI ethics standard. So let me briefly um, summarize the contents. And so this is having the vision of trustworthy AI for everyone. So quite ambitious vision. So and so the the main it is providing three um, strategic plan. The the first one is so called uh, making out uh, environment or circumstances for trustworthy AI um, technology, and the second one is the making the foundation for safe AI um, utilization, and the third one is the uh, broadening the AI mindfulness. Uh, to the um, society and, and to the people. So this was the, uh, to the recent updated information of Korean AI um, discussion. And somehow, uh, very um, interestingly, so last night while I was Googling Korean news, um, so one branch of Korea, so this is the, the National Committee of Human Rights. So actually the other two, the AI ethics guide, uh, guidelines and, and strategic plan was provided um, so-called uh, the fourth revolution committee uh, on the direct um, kind of um, governing of president. And, and so yesterday I found that the, uh, the different branch of Korean government, the, uh, the human rights committee, something like that, uh, provided uh, so-called um, guidelines for um, trustworthy AI um, respecting human rights. So one, how to say one, um, one new or that can be quite so think bring about quite arguable argue, um, um, argues among societies is that uh, they provide a guideline of forbidding forbidding high risk AI techniques so which can uh, bring about kind of concern of a human uh, human uh, human right etc so they they are taking kind of precautionary attitude so um, even though um, in the level of guidelines, but and and the other, so I could find some, and and they also uh, uh, made out recommend recommendation of the forbidden of make utilizing uh, AI technology for for maybe making some armory or for for the military regimes. So this this was the key um, titles of the news. So um, let me stop here for um, introducing the short story of Korean uh, policy. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, I want to um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I want to plant a question that we can come back to, and and and, and this is also um, something that I invite the the audience to 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 think about. If I were to, you know, so you all know what the Control F function is in, in word processing, you know, find and replace. If I were to go into that strategy. Um, or, or really, I mean, you know, uh, most strategies that are produced by governments around AI and replace AI with IT, mm -hmm. or even technology generally, it would still sound pretty, I would, I submit, it would sound pretty apropos. Um, so why do we need all of this specialized focus on AI as opposed to technology or um, IT, uh, you know, more specifically. F food for thought, I want to come back to that. Uh, Matt, um, my, I, I'd love for you to um, tell us a little bit about um, whether there is a dominant narrative yet in China around AI and digital technologies more broadly, and, and if so, um, give us a little bit of color on your perception of that, that narrative. 
Sure. Yeah, I think it's there. There have been kind of a series of dominant narratives, and I think maybe we're right now in a point of transition into a new one that kind of corresponds to some policy processes. So I'd say if you kind of broke, you know, China's sort of trajectory on AI, public conversation and regulation into like a few different phases, you had kind of an initial phase, say 2012 to 2016 or so when you know, it was just kind of bubbling up in the private sector. The, the private sector companies that were a little ahead of the curve started talking more about AI or implementing it in the areas. Baidu was a relatively like early, Baidu the, the search engine was a relatively sort of early adopter and they made some big investments and some big hires. But it hadn't, at that point in time when the public sector or when regulators were talking about AI, it was always big data, big data, big data that was kind of just seen as like a panacea for a bunch of social problems. I'd say the second phase in China's AI development came starting around 2017, maybe up through 2020, which was sort of kicked off by China releasing its national AI plan in 2017. And this was kind of like the, the go, go, go period in which the government is throwing a lot of sort of fuel on the fire of Chinese AI, what was already happening in the private sector the public sector is just throwing money at projects, they're subsidizing things, they're opening accelerators, they're launching programs, all this kind of stuff. You had a real sort of boom in funding uh, for the industry. And during that period of time, I think the dominant narrative was this, this phrase they, um, and I, you know, different sectors have different narratives, but the phrase that kept coming up, especially in kind of like a more geopolitical context, was this Chinese phrase called Wan Dao, uh, Joshua, Wan Dao Chao Chua, which means to pass a car on a curve, hmm. basically meaning you know there there are moments when when the world uh, or when industry or technology goes around a curve, and that's the best moment to kind of pass someone, I guess. And so AI was seen as this one of these moments. China Chinese government especially often thinks you know hey we missed the first industrial revolution or we missed the second one, we were late to the IT and internet revolution, but we kind of caught maybe up to the present day circa twenty. By 2016 or so, you could say the Chinese internet industry was as thriving as anywhere. And AI is the first one where they said, no, this is actually where we can take the lead. We can be at the forefront of this technology. And that, inclu you know, that includes both the, the production of it and the regulation of it, um, you know, pioneering concepts in that area. So I think that was a, a big narrative for a while. In some ways, that's taken a backseat. One, because just I'd say the general sort of hype around China's AI industry has slightly cooled off. To come back down to like a more rational place for people both in and outside of China, but also because China sort of realized that this was a bad look. It was bringing a lot of heat uh, to China when they said, you know, we're going to lead, we're going to lead the world in AI, or we're going to made in China 2025 is kind of what kicked off the trade war. Anything that says China is going to surpass other countries and be number one, the government kind of turned down the rhetoric on all those sort of plans. They took those phrases out. And I think we've sort of seen it cooling off the sort of the one Dao Chao Chua, the past the car and the curve narrative. And now I guess I would say, I don't know that there's a very specific narrative around it, but I'd say we've entered a phase that is focused on more on governance and issues like that. There's still tons going on in the private sector. There's still a lot going on in the research community, but a lot of, lots of the biggest sort of splashiest news stories, narratives, or, or kind of you know, gear shifts, changes in China's AI industry and conversation around governance. In 2021, we saw China start to roll out this rapid series of regulations on recommendation algorithms, on deep fakes, uh, on uh, trustworthy AI and all these areas. And that's, I think, you know, I might be slightly biased because I'm very interested in these things and I'm following this in my own research. So maybe I'm over indexing on it. But I do think that that has kind of maybe moved more towards the front forefront of how, how are we going to govern AI and, and can China take in some way, you know, how can it solve its problems domestically and can it, uh, uh, you know, lead internationally. And when I say solve its problems domestically, this is all, you know, refracted through the CCP prism. CCP solve its problems domestically, which sometimes overlap with the needs of people and sometimes are clearly in conflict with the needs of people. Thanks, Matt. Um, so. You know, I, th there. I mean, so you know, Korea uh, is, is active. You know, in, in thinking through, you know, the future of, of governance when it comes to AI. Um, China is. You know, the Europeans have um, the AI Act. Um, I would. I would. You know, in the U.S., um, 
NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, issued a draft framework for AI risk management uh, about, a, about a month ago, I think. Uh, so there's a lot happening um, in this space, um, even though the technology um, is still relatively immature. Um, certainly, you know, we're not, we're not at a point where, um, you know, if we're thinking about automated vehicles, level five vehicles, we're not, we're not, you know, close to that. Um, if, you know, we're, me we're, we're measuring things in technology years, 10 years is a long time, <laughs> you know, in, in, in technology. Um, our, and, and, and Daniel, you know, you, 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 you've been involved in, in High's AI index, which, um, you know, tr does a really effective job at sort of um, pulling out, na you know, both national and global trends around um, AI use, R&D, deployment, governance. Um, my, my question, and I, and I do want to come back to the, contr the control F question, is are we, are we too soon? Is it too soon to be thinking about AI from a regulatory perspective as opposed to, you know, a more general principles perspective? What do, what do you think? Um, thanks, um, Any for that question. So um, just as you said, we kind of in our 2022 AI Next report published in, May, uh, in March this year, we kind of did an analysis of in select 25 countries of how will we act in terms of AI governance. Because um, you can see from 2015 to now, in, especially in the first three years, 2015, 2018, there is a, this large sum of AI regulations popping up, uh, excuse me, AI-related bills popping up that mostly focus on promoting the development of AI through more investment, strengthening AI education, and just pouring more money into AI. And in recent years, as Matt, as Matt suggested, not only in China, but also you see this in the EU and other countries that there are more regulations on, uh, focusing on kind of curbing the risk uh, and uh, you know, focusing on the management of regulations. Um, I think this is not for, uh, like, uh, this is kind of for a reason, right? Because more and more um, we see recently that see research um, or just applications of AI systems kind of uh, discriminating against certain populations, in underrepresented populations. Or in China's case, for example, um, there's this narrative of promoting social well-being because you have more controversial like news titles coming out in the public where we say people are just getting discriminated because they're price gouging or kids starting to get more um, addicted to uh, AI systems, like those, you know, TikToks, mm. recommended systems. So there are a lot of those news popping up, and I think the, the wave of regulations also serve as a way of, you know, uh, addressing those public concerns. Um, in the States speci specifically, you see those, less of those um, narratives on the federal level. As you said, there is this NISC risk management um, draft that was just getting a request for information right now, but most of the regulations you're seeing are on the provincial, uh, excuse me, on the state and on the municipality level. You see those regulations coming from San Francisco on uh, banning the uh, surveillance um, cameras, but on the federal level, there's still this lack of coherent strategy of how do we regulate AI. I think for um, you see some drafts, for example, Senator Wyden's office and Booker's office introduced the Algorithm Accountability Act earlier this year. Um, they introduced it in 2019, but there was not much attention, and this, year, this time they reintroduced, reintroduced it, but it's still not getting as much attention, or it, the likelihood it passes still, um, we're still yet way to be seen. Uh, but I think in the States, it's still in that process where people are saying, like, let's still wait it out and see um, where this technology is going. Um, but I, th I think like in the EU, in China, people are starting to move forward. Yeah, I, you know, I'm... Um I, 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 earlier in my career, I spent, I still spent a lot of time on um, cyber security issues, um, you know, um, and one of the the lessons, <laughs> the hard lessons um, in, in cyber security is that when, you know, the, the, the core technologies of the internet uh, were developed, they were not developed with security in mind and we're still paying a price. And so, on the one hand, I think it's um, you know uh, really encouraging that 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 there's this debate about AI risk, even when the technology is immature, because it gives us an opportunity to avoid um, the many mistakes that that we all made when it when it, when, it, when it comes to this sort of you know incumbent generation of digital technology. On the other hand, 
I, 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 by framing these problems as AI risk versus IT risk or technology risk more generally, what, what I mean, so thinking about this from a liability perspective, um, because I mean, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, so is Professor Hio, so you know, I, I think about liability a lot. <laughs> um, and, and so do, by the way, um, the CEOs and their general counsels of companies. Uh, it has a huge impact on the safety and reliability of technology. Um, by framing these challenges as AI specific as opposed to uh, IT or even tech you know, generally, what is gained or lost in terms of thinking about um, uh, liability rules uh, for the technology? So catch on from what? Yeah, yeah, why don't you start, yeah. My fellow, my fellow attorney. Yeah, sure, uh, surely. Uh, so thank you um, for your big and wonderful questions. So, so my, my short version answer might be that it's um, the purely my idea, but so that is related to my first question. So whether to be whether to govern AI or whether to be governed by AI. <laughs> so um, maybe the difference between um, IT or, or technology version of maybe um, strategic plan or something like that, or, or so with uh, different from that kind of AI um, standard ethics or AI governing issues might be. Um, so as a human being, so we are sharing some concerning about kind of this new kind of technology, AI, it might go out of our control in some way. Or, or so you mentioned about the liability issues, but so even so the IT and technology issues era, so human beings have achieved a lot of huge development, but I think up until that time, so we were fully confident that as a human being, we are not losing the grip or, or controlling uh, of that technology or, or IT. And we can um, utilize or use that um, technology for the uh, welfare improving of human beings in total. And dur during that um, process, if some problem or some failure happens, so we were very much confident that we can track down or track back uh, who, to whom that liability can be should be levied upon. So with that, uh, we 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 were confident that we can do our kind of um, optimization of, of uh, social risk or something like that. Uh, but so in the kind of machine learning or deep learning based AI technologies, so even though still. Uh, the human beings, human beings factors are deeply involved in, like in the designing the algorithm or, or data feeding process. But uh, different from the, the early stage of AI, which you try to follow the human beings thinking way composed of node by node, so in which we can track back to, to some stage when, when final outcomes bring some failure. So we can, we can uh, go back and maybe try to find issues and, and mm, develop some liability schemes. But in this deep learning or machine learning AI, or, or more developed version of AI in, in the near future, so probably so we are not so sure uh, to whom or to which we should levy the liability um, issues. And so we are not fully confident of that, that topics. So that is um, the basic, how to say, um, um, difference or, or the short, or not short version of answer to your question. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of, of the debate over GMOs, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, um, where, um, you know, much of the concern about the technology, especially um, in, in Europe, um, had to do with um, fear of, Losing control of, of the technology, right? That you know, GMOs um, either you know displaying emergent properties that you know the scientists hadn't predicted, um, or you know spreading um, in ways that you know that that um, in the critics' views might undermine biodiversity, right? And and you know, I mean, GMOs now, if you look at the global 
market for GMOs. Um, the difference between Europe, which um, has roundly rejected the technology, and the United States, which um, where you know there's there's very little stigma attached to it, um, is is astonishing. I mean, it, it's and I. And, and, and the, the principle that comes into play here is this idea of a, of a precautionary principle. Um, the idea being that, that, that um, it is okay to um, regulate um, when confronted with um, massive irreversible risks, um, even when the scientific evidence for those risks is shaky. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a play on uncertainty as opposed to the, the traditional, certainly the, the, the U.S. emphasis on cost-benefit analysis where, you know, you, you rack and stack costs and benefits and come to a quote-unquote rational decision about um, which approach is better. Um, I'm curious, Matt, I mean, is, do you see any shades of precaution within the Chinese um, um, regulatory and governance debate around AI? Or, or does it tend to lean more towards this kind of, you know, kind of, again, rational, you right. know, cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, um, like I said, I wanted to chip in one thing on the kind mm -hmm. of value of regulating, quote unquote, AI versus just a, another Please. term. I think this is one where it's, you see an interesting difference between, say, like the EU AI Act and the, the kind of smattering of regulations that have come out of China in the sense of, are you trying to create one umbrella regulation that is going to assess and govern all things related to AI? That's the EU AI Act. Take AI, big tent, divide it into risk tiers, and then apply criteria. Whereas while China does have these kind of frameworks saying, hey, we want to we want to develop a comprehensive set of regulations around AI, the specific regulations are, are targeting specific problems or specific technologies. So recommendation algorithms, it's kind of, you know, how, how responsible is a company or what obligations does a company have based on the fact that they're pushing content to individuals using a machine learning algorithm. Um, that's still a pretty big question and big problem, but it's, it's a lot more specific than saying we're going to govern AI. And maybe the better one is the they put out regulations on deep fakes, what they call deep synthesis technology, mm -hmm. where it's like, that's a concrete problem. We haven't seen how it plays out in a million different places, but you can begin to get your hands around it. And I think the, a lot of times this happens in China. They may have some high level principles, some gestures at sort of abstract concepts, but really it kind of gets pieced together by a bunch of ground level activities or ground level regulations. So in that way, yeah, I, I tend to be a little bit mm, side-eye with the regulations that say these are the principles and the actions that are going to govern everything that is AI. You know, you couldn't have said we're going to govern all electricity in, you know, 1910 or whatever. It would have made sense to look at the specifics. So that's just a thought on, on that front. Um, on the precautionary principle thing, I think it's a mixed bag in China depending on what the perceived threat or problem is. Generally speaking, China tends to have a you know, kind of let industry, let technology, let business models kind of run ahead a little bit, give them a little bit of, of, of rope. And then once you identify the problems, then you kind of rein it back in. And I think big picture, we've seen something like that with AI. 27, the first thing they do is they encourage AI development in a million different ways. And it kind of runs out in a million different ways. And then three years after or four years after the AI plan, then we start to put in place these building blocks of actually content this way, actually deep fakes this. And so I think there's a little bit of that kind of like leash and pull it in, but I, I carve out maybe two exceptions or, or areas where they differ a little bit. One, China tends to be extremely sensitive about content control. You know, the Chinese government is, is very worried about ideological control. So in some areas, they'll kind of, you know, they'll, they'll lead with that and they won't let that run out very far ahead. Sometimes they have a hard time catching up, you know, even like with the dissemination of microblogs, like Weibo, you know, Twitter-esque type things. They first just happened in the world. You know, China had the firewall to keep everything out, but they weren't ready for that onslaught. And then they reined it back in like three, four years later. I think that's partly what we're seeing with like the recommendation algorithm uh, rules. You know, they see these kind of content, you know, recommendation engines as like an accelerant to the dissemination of information. And now, after having seen how that starts, they really want to pull that back in. So that's one area, you know, generally on speech, content, censorship, they, they, they take the, the, their own version of the precautionary principle. Um, and then one area where we haven't yet seen, like, 
concrete regulations yet, but that they're they're speaking in in precautionary terms is around stuff about AI safety, AI controllability, AI reliability, all the way back to 2018. You had Xi Jinping himself saying like we need to proactively think through the future risks that would come from AI, and we need to take the steps to ensure safety, reliability, was it Joshua? security, reliability, and controllability. Um, and so that, you know, we haven't seen exactly how that plays out yet, but that as far as world leaders speaking directly to those things and saying that they need to be a kind of a concern from day one, that sounds, you know, uh, kind of on the precautionary side of things. Um, I, I think this distinction between um, the kind of broad sweeping approach that the Europeans have taken when it comes to uh, dealing with technology risk, right? So GDPR falls in that category. Um, the, uh, the Cybersecurity Act, you know, the, the, the proposed uh, NIST II um, regulation, um, I think it's regulation, yeah. Um, in, in Europe also kind of fall in these categories. Um, uh, my sense is that, I mean, in Korea, so in the U.S., we, 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 we too tend to take a sector-by-sector -sector approach to regulatory policy. Um, you know, there's sort of famously no kind of baseline privacy statute in the United States. Um, and uh, instead, um, this is an example, uh, instead, um, Privacy risk is is handled by sector specific regulatory agencies, right? So there, there's you know HHS Health and Human Services has you know a HIPAA you know, health information basically I, I'm going to butcher the acronym, um, but it's basically has to do with security and privacy of healthcare data. They administer that rule. There are other there's rules around financial data, Fair Credit Reporting Act that affect among others um, you know, that affect the financial services sector. Um, but there's no baseline law. Same is true in cybersecurity. Um, in in Korea, um, and, and I think you know th these these tra these traditions, I think, are going to carry over to AI. I, su I suspect, um, at least um, in the near term, because they reflect, I think, um, kind of uh, fairly deep seated kind of political legal culture. Um, in in Korea, what is is there is there a a tendency one way or the other to, to go in sort of the more, call it European style sweeping approach uh, to technology uh, versus uh, the more American style, and even, just, even to some extent the Chinese approach, uh, although the Chinese, Chinese have enacted a number of sort of comprehensive laws as well. Uh, I'd well, love for your perspective on, on, on how you see that tendency. Where is that tendency in Korea? And um, how do you think it will shake out vis-a-vis -vis AI um, policy? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so this is quite, how to say, so quite, can be quite acad academic question. So let me briefly um, answer. So the, the jurisprudence or the legal system of Korea has been um, heavily affected by civil law system of the, um, the European continent, like um, Germany or France. Uh, through uh, Japan, Japanese colonization period, so up, up until uh, mid um, mid twentieth century. Uh, so I can say that on on the fundamentals or the basis, so we are um, taking or following um, more uh, European style um, um, legal system. So, but on top of that civil law system, so after nineteen sixties. So Korean economy and Korean societies has been heavily, uh, much affected by um, United States, so including the legal system. So as a legal scholar, so I cannot simply say that Korean legal system is following the um, maybe a civil system. Mm, so we are kind of hybrid and mixed system. So this kind of um, combination or, or mixture is also happening in um, this new um, technology or AI um, regulation system. So for example, so up until maybe 15, 16 years ago, so the uh, online data privacy issues has not been um, directly uh, uh, kind of provided in Korean legal um, jurisprudence. So actually, so 
at the time I was a judge at the Seoul Central District Court. So I was the judge who firstly dealt with that kind of on the online data privacy issues. Uh, and so after my ruling, so I'm not mm, sure how much I was affected, but so after that, the Korean Congress uh, passed the enactment for uh, privacy protection. So even at that time, so Korea was taking the, how to say, the overall general uh, regulation or pro protection of legal system. So that was still uh, maintaining up until recently. So up until the Korean society did not much realize uh, how much the, the data can have can become the source of how to say, value in the future and how AI can maybe be developed um, with the oil of um, private data issues. So before that, we were trying to uh, look at issues only from the traditional uh, privacy issues. Um, so kind of protection is the, the major goal or something like that. But what I see is that in this um, AI uh, regime, so. Uh, uh, Korean government and, and, and civil society is realizing that this is quite new issue, as I mentioned, different from IT or technology. So uh, this is not such an easy, how to say, uh, regulatory or legislative goal so which can be dealt with in a traditional way. So that is the um, circumstances if, uh, I understand now. So uh, let me follow up maybe after the discussions here. Thank you. Um, I, so, so, you know, g given these, um, you know, sort of architectural, um, that this architectural um, uh, variety in, in the way that, 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 that countries um, approach tech regulation generally and, and by extension in all likelihood AI specifically, um, Daniel, you, you um, so ha Daniel um, led the development of this report, uh, Multilateral Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Institute. Um, there are many co-authors on the paper, including myself, but Dan was really the, the driving force behind it, and, and uh, I really appreciate his, his leadership. Um, th this, this, this idea comes out of, of, uh, of a, uh, an AI commission that... Um, that uh, produced a report, I think it was last year, and what, 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 what Dan uh, and, and the team did is sort of take that idea of a multilateral artificial intelligence research institute and try to kind of breathe practical life into it and, and, and articulate, okay, how, what would this actually look like? How would, as an institution, how would one design it? Um, and why don't you lay out for us the, the, sort of the value proposition for multilateral artificial intelligence research, to, especially against this backdrop of, of diversity in terms of approaches to, to governance? Yeah, um, and I want to address a pre prior question real quick on yeah, IT versus AI. I think I kind of tied into my answer for um, what we call multilateral AI research institute. I think the challenges for AI versus other technologies is um, as the professor said, it's a quite complex system, right? And one particularly is a black box problem where we don't necessarily know how AI comes to its decisions. Um, you know, we have published a policy brief at High where based on an academic research led by uh, Stanford professors and professors around the United States on how there are medical AI systems that are able to detect, detect the race of patients um, without the physician knowing. And the implication with that is, you know, a very complicated situation, but in this case, because of that problem, it posed a unique challenge to regulatory approach, namely all the terms we've, we've heard of, like auditing AI algorithms, how do you make sure every step of when people designing AI that there is accountability mechanism embedded to ensure the fair outcome um, and fair decision making. And uh, as well as you know, explainability, how do you ensure that AI algorithms are able to provide explainability um, or provide like, explanations of their decisions? So in light of that, um, I think based on a recommendation, as Annie mentioned, from the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence report published last year, we kind of spearheaded this academic research um, that took a, a few months to kind of propose this idea we call Multilateral AI Research Institute. In short, we call it MARI. What MARI does, or what we want, what we recommended to do, is for the United States government to create this 
unified platform with like-minded countries, especially those countries who are willing to commit to human-centered AI and responsible AI to um, have researchers from all the different countries uh, with all those like countries come together to work on technical AI research and AI governance and AI norms issues together. So why do we recommend that? First is because this unique challenge to AI regulatory approach, we really think that we need this unified approach among like-minded countries to tackle this challenge together. Nowadays, when you look at the landscape of AI governance around the world, you see every country have their own approach. Or even on the international level, OECD has an AI principle. UNESCO just put forward these recommendations on um, ethical AI. And uh, as you mentioned multiple times, EU AI Act is also um, have this umbrella um, approach to AI regulations. Even within EU, uh, now we're drafting the EU AI Act. France, for example, two days ago, just take a step forward, mentioning that they want to regulate um, general purpose AI instead of the high risk AI that most of EU um, is, are talking about right now. So you see this really different approach everywhere um, and the question remain now, what is the best approach or what is one unified that we can all take us, move all take us forward on that, um, on uh, regulating AI. So we hope that UNESCO, uh, we hope that Mary can provide that platform for government, government and research come together to figure that out together. And also, a big part of Mary is to promote cross-country collaboration on AI. There are a lot of problems right now with AI, uh, issues with AI research right now that can only be solved via that cross-country collaboration. For example, we heard a lot about large language models like GPT-3 um, that was um, that OpenAI developed that can kind of take one sentence that you put and generate a whole paragraph based on it. But most of those large language systems you're seeing are English-based. Uh, you don't see um, uh, a lot of large language models for Chinese, um, though Chinese are developing that um, uh, as we speak, and they have actually successful performance models, but for less um, used, uh, or, or like languages in um, other European countries, African countries, you don't see large language models um, designed to help those populations. So to solve those issues, I think it's essential for you know, countries to come together with research with different expertise, different culture, um, to develop those multilingual like, language models. And final point I want to say real quick is to help with um, equitably distribute AI resources to different countries or even within the United States. Um, with, uh, with AI right now, you really need large compute resources, you need a lot of data to train AI models. And even within the United States, you see those kind of concentrated in Silicon Valley, even at elite universities like Stanford. Uh, universities with less resources um, in other states may have you know, less compute resources or less data access to help them train their AI models to perfect their AI models. And that same goes internationally. So with Mary, we hope that we'll provide a flat platform where different countries provide all those, those compute resources together and those data access to their own data so um, you know, to train more AI models internationally. Uh, th thanks, Daniel. Um, let, let me, um, so we, we've got about uh, 13 minutes left um, in this panel. Um, I would love to open it up to Q&A. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, President Lee, and then um, we'll go to Ana Maria. So Ash is going to walk over with the microphone, and, and President Lee, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, um, we'd appreciate it. Um, uh, my name is Kim Lee. I'm president of the Korea Foundation and also a professor at Seoul National University. I have a question on, on that MARI initiative. Uh, of course, obviously, you cannot include all the uh, AI research institutes in the world. So there should be a kind of uh, selection criteria. Absolutely. So can you give us a little bit about that criteria? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I think we recommended um, the U.S. government to work with like-minded countries. I think this term is very, very important here. What do you mean by like-minded like countries, especially those countries who are willing to commit to the development of AI that, uh, excuse me, de de dem democracy-affirming AI that aligns with human-centric values and aligns with democratic values. So, um, you know, countries like the U.S. allies and partners the, in, the, uh, in the EU, in South America, um, South Korea, Japan, all that. That's in our initial proposal. And we recognize that it is a pretty ambitious task. And we all, we also, 
because of that, we also recommend the marriage to work with established institutes around the world to serve as satellite centers. There's a lot of, um, you know, like, like OECD has Center for Excellence in Canada, in France, and um, South Korea has very established AI institutes. Japan has, has those as well. So um, the goal is to create that large networks um, to uh, work on AI together. Let me, I wanna, before, before we turn it over to Anne-Marie, I wanna maybe ask Matt um, a follow-up question here, which is um, yesterday, um, Ambassador Choi and I were, 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 were talking about um, this idea of an economic analog for the security dilemma that um, IR theorists talk about, right? So the security dilemma is where your militaries build up, uh, you know, and the, the buildup of one country uh, prompts the other country to get concerned about that buildup uh, and build up its own military, and so these, these defensive measures uh, can uh, in a, you know, kind of contribute to a, you know, a, a potentially risky cycle of military buildup that, the, that can then lead to miscalculation, mistake, and, 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 and conflict. And you know, there's, I, I, we're wondering, is, is there you know, an analogous risk vis-a-vis -vis China and some of these um, like-minded initiatives where obviously um, you know, I mean, the value of a like-minded initiative makes a ton of sense, uh, and you know, as far as selection criteria goes, it's it's, you know, it's an obvious way to sort of think about who the best partners are. On the other hand, uh, you know, Ch China is not going to <laughs> would not enjoy or, or appreciate an initiative like this. H how, um, you know, could you provide us a little bit of color to how you think they might react? And whether there is any um, any uh, mechanism uh, or or opportunity to uh, blunt that dynamic uh, from a Chinese perspective. Sure. Yeah, I think the the kind of the baseline ideological you know the ideological foundation for a security dilemma type situation is very strong in China. They have very much believed for a very long time that the US and other like-minded countries, you know, mostly uh, in Europe, but sometimes throw in Japan or something, are trying to limit China, encircle China, make bring China back to its sort of subservient weak era of say 1850 to 1980, or however you, they call it the century of humiliation. So that's very baked into the ideology within China. So they're, they are very prone to, to think of things in that way. Um, you know, just because the other side sees something that way, that doesn't mean it's not a good idea to do it on some level, especially with the, the sort of the ideological trajectory of China under Xi Jinping. Some of these things are, you know, no matter how kind of nicely you, you might frame it, um, they're, they're, they're going to interpret it how they will. I think in terms of ways to kind of blunt that, usually the, the go-to is, you know, include a very diverse set of countries, so not just the U.S. and Europe. Um, and create don't don't create a, a situation where you say everyone but China or people not that not named China, but you set a sort of a set of criteria that you would actually love for China to meet that set of criteria, and they're somewhat clear, and they are they actually could be met by China in some situation, but if China chooses not to meet them, then they are not involved. This is somewhat the model that people were trying to use for the uh, TP. What am I? Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just, this is not an anti-China pact. We're just going to set very high standards and then everyone who meets them is invited in. China still didn't like the TPP and it failed because we couldn't hold it together domestically to actually join ourselves. So there's no kind of, you know, silver bullet to this type of thing. I think, um, I think some, some strides have been made within the Biden administration to kind of cool down some of these perceptions. If not, you know, cooling down these perceptions within the, the high ranks of the Chinese government is going to be very difficult. But I think it's important to recognize that China's AI ecosystem is much, much, much bigger than the government. How normal Chinese people see the treatment of Chinese American researchers in the US or Chinese immigrant researchers in the US, that's a big kind of signal for people in China. Is this country open? Does this country care about people like me? Do, do I want to work with them in, in productive ways? And so, yeah, the, the kind of, uh, you know, disentangling the security dilemma vis-a-vis -vis Beijing is going to be very hard. 
but doing it, you know, there are ways to set it up so it's not quite so glaringly like us versus them, um, you know, by including a lot more diverse set of countries and setting kind of objective sort of criteria. And then also, you know, the, I, I, I almost, I, I hesitate to say this firmly, but I almost think it's more important how does kind of the, the, the people working in China's AI and industry feel about mm -hmm. America and the US than it is exactly how Beijing feels about it. Don't quote that, hedge that statement a bunch of different ways. But the US, is, <laughs> <laughs> the US the US is the USA ecosystem is hugely reliant on Chinese people choosing to come to the US, study in the US, stay and work in the US. That makes up a huge part of our workforce. And our kind of soft power perception vis-a-vis -vis those people is is hugely important. I, I, I agree. I, I thought the, the China initiative was a disgrace. You can quote me on that. <laughs> um, great. Uh, Ana Maria, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Ana Maria Osola, uh, the Global Digital Governance Fellow here in Stanford and also in Taltech. Um, thank you for the discussion. As a lawyer myself, uh, then I'm very interested in the regulatory aspects, and I really like the discussion and the points you um, you raised, especially when Andy was proposing that perhaps it is too soon to talk about the regulation of AI. Uh, this reminded me of a, a quote from a researcher uh, Mieke de Getalara, who said that if we look at the development of AI, then it can be comparable with a child of one and a half year old. So we are really early. So what is really the point and effectiveness of, of uh, such regulation? And then you also raise the differences of having uh, domestic initiatives, then having regional, like the EU proposals, so what is the best way? You have the initiative of Mary, which looks at the more global governance perspective, which um, which is a great initiative, but but given these clusters and the different approaches, it uh, will certainly be a challenge. So what do you think about the role of standardization in this regard? Standards can be seen as you know a soft way of regulating or at least starting the ne negotiation. We know that um, standardization is a strategic priority for, for example, the EU, the US, also China. So um, we know that China is very active in different standardization bodies. What is your perspective on this? Would you say that this is a, a, good, fa a good way forward? Thanks. So let me go first on the quick answers. Uh, so about the regulating AI, so in a kind of most demo democratic countries, so the regulation by the agencies cannot be done by the agency themselves. So it, that uh, regulating power should be delegated from, um, from Congress. Um, so with the, uh, the congressmen so who are uh, democratically um, selected by the people. So in that sense, the, uh, the co coercive power through regulation should come from delegation from the, the people. So, so that is the, the way how, how to say legal norms um, so supporting the, the authority of regulating power Mm, can be supported in a democratic um, country generally. But what I see is that up until now, so in most countries, um, that kind of concrete normative conformity among the people has not been firmly made yet to make uh, some concrete legislation so which can delegate um, maybe regulatory power to agency. So one interesting or, or funny um, aspect of this event is that so in that kind of too early sentiment, we are somehow using the, the term of ethics, kind of AI ethics, to, because we are all sharing that we don't know much, but we need to do something not to be governed by AI. So let's try to do, make out some standard or do the kind of standardization thing through quite a vague or abstract concept of ethics, but as a legal scholar, this is quite unique situation because um, the term of ethics or the content of ethics can be, can be itself quite vague and abstract and, and can be surely different from nation by nation or, or culture by culture. So in that sense, so as a civil, civil societies, people try best their best to refrain to use the ethics, the concept of ethics as the legal origin of maybe coercive power of the nation. But somehow, 
So in, under this kind of uncertainty uh, AI risk issues, so we are depending or utilizing the, the idea of ethics and maybe this can be used as a channel for standardization of, of kind of AI technolo technology, region by region or, or culture by, by culture. So this is quite, yeah, quite interesting, not just academically, but also uh, in a society generally, so quite, quite noticeable events. I'm very much curious uh, how things will uh, come out in the near future. Yeah, and I'll add, I, you know, standards are um, almost never at the cutting edge. They're, they they always, um, almost always emerge in response to um, a combination of industry demand and a demonstrated problem that uh, standards um, can can help solve. Um, and so, in a sense, I mean, they're they're reactive. Um, and I, you know, I, I, part of what makes the debate about AI governance uh, so fascinating is um, these sort of temporal questions around, you know, when is it appropriate to, you know, for the state to exercise the coercive power of regulation versus relying on, uh, you know, the market, uh, relying on um, ethical principles to to shape um, behavior and, and 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 use of AI and. You know, standards, um, I think, are, are I mean, f f for the reasons I just mentioned, uh, may, not, may not work, um, may, may not scratch that, that near-term itch. I, I will note that, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 we've talked a little bit about the Technology Trade Council with, with the US EU TTC, and another one of the outcomes this weekend was um, a, uh, a commitment to, uh, uh, engage more fulsomely on standards development around technology, uh, and that, that that's, you know, uh, for those who followed um, U.S. European trade negotiations over the years, standards have been one of the hardest issues uh, between the two sides, um, and uh, you know, uh, but this this seems to me to be uh, at least signal a political will to maybe try again to address. Um, those challenges, uh, the, the roots of, 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 of the, the challenge are, have to do with the way that the two sides go about developing standards and the extent of industry participation and, and other factors. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, maybe long term, but near term, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of skeptical, um, so. Oh, um, well, I'll tell you what, we, we, we are actually at our time, but uh, I, Shashi's had his hand up, you've had your hand up. Um, if people don't, we have a break right now. Uh, so if, um, let me suggest if um, people want to go use the restroom, take a break, please do so, but I, I, would, I would welcome your question. Um. Okay, my name is Choi, uh, the former ambassador of, of economy and trade in Korean foreign ministry. Um, Actually, uh, uh, just as the Professor uh, mentioned, uh, actually uh, at the moment, it is now at the stage of ethics uh, or principles uh, stage uh, to handle uh, AI questions. But when we come up with uh, liability questions, I think the uh, issue is not that much simple. With ethics, uh, we cannot handle the liability issues. We need to have a kind of a legally binding arrangement Otherwise, it's uh, very difficult to uh, uh, deal with effectively this uh, liability questions. Therefore, I mean, codification may be inevitable, but uh, we don't know actually uh, uh, when we can, we can have, uh, we can uh, reach to that point, yeah? Mm -hmm. So just a question. Well, I, I'm reminded of the, pro the product process distinction in trade law, international trade law, where, and this, this came up in the GMO debate too, where, you know, what, what matters more, the, the, the outcome or product of a technology or the process by which um, you know, the technology is developed and, and deployed? And in the GMO debate, you know, the, 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 process, the Europeans asserted the process matters, right? The fact that it's bioengineered is, is integral to understanding the risk. The American approach was no, we're, we're process agnostic. Really what matters is the product, the, that product that comes out of that process. And, I think there's something similar happening here with respect to AI, where on the one hand, you know, you could take a case like um, deep fakes, where I mean, like 
the process, I mean, the, the, the product wouldn't be possible without the process, without the AI technology. In other cases, uh, think about um, an, an AI algorithm that uh, discriminates against protected categories of people uh, for credit, right? Um, we have a law that prohibits that already, right? And so, I mean, maybe there are challenges unique to AI about how the, that organization builds a compliance program to avoid discrimination. Maybe there's some challenges with detecting discrimination, but at the end of the day, there's a law in the book that says you, bank, cannot discriminate against people um, for credit decisions. Um, and that, that, I think that, that's going to be a theme I, I suspect we'll see play out you know, over the next five, 10 years as we wrap our heads around AI governance. Um, Shashi, you had your hand up. I think we've got time for one last question. Sorry for in interrupting your, your break, which I'm sure we, we all need. My name is Sashi Jayakumar. I'm a visiting researcher from, from Singapore. I have a question observation for Matt. Maybe Daniel might be interested as well. This third wave, Matt, that you're talking about, this rash of regulations concerning AI governance and, and, and so on, I suppose it's easy for us to look at this as a logical continuation of progression from the earlier narrative of, of control. Because when we think China information, we think of censorship, control, the great firewall, social credit, and so on and so forth. But there is, from Southeast Asia, at least in as much as anyone looks at these issues in Southeast Asia, there is the embryonic developings of another kind of narrative on when it comes to these recent developments in China. And that is, China is being enlightened, it's siding with the consumers, and it's finally doing what actually the EU and the US, because the EU, they were first out of the gate with the, with the at least the draft of the, the AI Act, should have been doing all, all along. And I wonder if you might have thoughts on that. I have one of my researchers, I've just emailed her, she's from China, but based in my center, looking at AI information. And within the last few minutes, she tells me she's opened up her Taobao app. And she says that, she's surprised, and she says, yes, there is a, a button now where you get, if you press it, a list of collected personal information. She didn't know about it, and she, she goes on to say, she's allowed me to, to quote, although it may not have been put up in a timely enough fashion, China government has done its part and taken actions to protect personal information and ensure tr transparency of the AI algorithm. So I wonder, quite apart from the narrative of control and governance, and certainly Beijing and its agencies have to act in a certain way, whether this might be seen as something where in, in time, if this rash is developed, is frameworked properly, whether this might be seen as, as a model and indeed the way to bring all these platforms, not just in China, but in the West to, to heal, to, ex, to explain in a transparent and fair manner in a manner where arguably the US and the EU should have been doing all along. Thanks, Josh. I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer that question, uh, but try to keep it brief because we, we, we do want to bring things to a close here. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the basic answer is I completely agree. I think, you know, when speaking <laughs> to different audiences, you have to flag different things at the top. And a lot of times I, you know, I'm currently in Washington, D.C., you know, I have to preamble with, yes, control of information is paramount, da 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 but there's actually some really interesting stuff going on here. And while people in the U.S. are almost never going to look at China and say, hey, that's a great idea. We should do that same thing. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity to kind of learn indirectly. These things that China is rolling out, these requirements for algorithmic explainability or these requirements for kind of disclosure or ability to, to edit or delete the tags that you're tagged with in different algorithms, these are novel things, and we don't, honestly, we don't know if they're going to work. We, we don't know if they're going to achieve any of the stated goals of kind of giving power back to consumers. We don't know if they're going to, they, there's a big emphasis on protecting like delivery workers in China's um, sort of AI regulations. We basically, we're getting to watch China run experiments in these things. And if we can pay close attention to how it plays out, do consumers really have meaningful control or does kind of disclosure not really do enough? Do the, you know, can, uh, is, can these algorithms truly be explained? If you force companies to give an explanation or an interpretation, is that a meaningful action? So yeah, I, I'm, I'm preaching from the, you know, the same gospel or whatever that we don't have to copy China. We don't have to agree with China on all fronts, but they are running real world experiments on things that we have talked about or said we want to do, and we should learn from the results of those experiments. Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, and I want to thank uh, Daniel, Professor Hale, and Matt for uh, your time uh, this morning. Um, I really enjoyed uh, hearing your thoughts, and um, please join me in thanking them. 
Um, we, we will convene uh, in five minutes for our next uh, panel, so please grab coffee, use a restroom, um, we have some food out there, and uh, we'll see you in five minutes. Uh, but thank you again. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
to move the podium back. We're, we're, we won't yeah, use the podium. No, we don't, we don't yeah, need because the podium. Yeah, 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 guys couldn't see us. Yeah, yeah, you just move it all the way back. Yeah, we're not going to use that now. We're just, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, wait, no, we need more pressure. There we go. Now we can have a super seat over here. All the way back so that yeah, the other guys can see. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, maybe we can play the ball. We'll just tie down. Yeah, yeah. Can tie down. That's, that's <laughs> as far as we can go. Yeah, all right, th- thank you. Yeah. All right, let me go sign people. So basically what, what we have is we have... We have people here, and then we have um, a lot of people in the in the back here. So yeah. most mm-hmm. most of our audience is in the back. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, Look at the camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody looks very chill. So you're spending time in Taiwan or more? Well, I'm I'm cu- full time here now. Oh, full time. <laughs> I, I haven't felt the that the last what have you yeah there's no way you can go there yeah. all the quarantine rules make it you know, impossible I to obviously Hong Kong and to, uh, Taiwan well, open up yeah but they're opening up Hong Kong's opening up Singapore is completely open right yeah. I heard Korea, Korea yesterday was Japan open Japan also yeah. open so yeah it's getting better yeah, maybe China? Not, not China of course no not China no, 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 yeah, not not yeah. 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 parts of China yeah parts of China well, let, let us uh, let us begin. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to welcome um, Professor Shin and Professor Wong um, to uh, the table here uh, for a discussion on human capital in the innovation workforce. Uh, my name is Andy Grotto. I direct the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance at Stanford, where I'm also William J. Perry International Security Fellow and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, Joining me uh, is, um, to my far right, your left, um, is uh, Professor uh, Jiwook Shin. Um, uh, Professor Shin is the director of uh, the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, the William J. Perry Professor of Contemporary Korea, uh, the founding director of the Korea program, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this, this year. Um, just tomorrow. Very tomorrow in particular. Uh, a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute uh, and a professor of sociology, all uh, here at Stanford University. Um, as a historical, comparative, and political sociologist, his research has concentrated on social movements, nationalism, development, and international relations. Um, he is uh, working on a new research initiative seeking to examine potential benefits of talent flows in the Asia-Pacific region where cities, countries, and corporations have competed with, with one another to enhance their stock of brain power by drawing on the skills of both their own citizens as well as those of foreigners. Um, in the middle, we have uh, Professor uh, Philip Wong. Um, Professor Wong um, is Professor of Electrical Engineering, uh, the William R. and Innes Kerr Bell Professor in the School of Engineering. Um, and uh, he joined Stanford University uh, in 2004. Uh, before that, uh, he was uh, with the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center, uh, where he did many of the early research works that have led to uh, product technologies. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, um, he was on leave from Stanford and was the Vice President of Corporate Research at TSMC, uh, as we know, the largest uh, semiconductor foundry in the world, and since 2020, uh, remains the Chief Scientist of TSMC. Um, Professor Wong's research aimed to translate discoveries in science into practical technologies. His works have contributed to advancements in nanoscale science and technology, semiconductor technology, solid state devices, and electronic um, imaging. we are, uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, these two distinguished experts uh, w- with me up here today. Um, and a theme that we have heard throughout the last day and a half of the conference um, is uh, the, um, the shortage of, of, of uh, talent, uh, certainly in the semiconductor industry where um, your every major uh, semiconductor manufacturer and many of their suppliers um, have flagged workforce shortages as a real problem, especially as 
uh, the United States and, and other countries embark on um, you know, major initiatives to, to build new fabs uh, that will employ thousands. Um, and you know, these, these problems exist in, in many other areas, uh, cybersecurity, uh, AI, data analytics, you name it. Um, and so I thought um, I would start our conversation uh, by uh, sort of turning to um, Professor Shin um, and you know, sort of walk us through some of the, the major the major challenges that that um, have kind of conspired to create this this pipeline problem. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Andrew, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so uh, let me speak about Korea, but I think to uh, large extent, uh, you know, same thing for Japan, uh, Taiwan, and some other countries uh, in Asia. So. In terms of uh, human capital, uh, I call it uh, triple, uh, triple challenges. Okay, one is, uh, you know, low birth rate. Okay, so I think Korea has the lowest uh, birth rate in the world. Probably Japan might be number two. <laughs> uh, so when I was growing up uh, in Korea in 1960s and 70s, the main uh, challenge was to contain population. Okay, so you know, government was saying that please have only two babies, okay? But now, young Koreans don't have, don't, don't want to have any babies. So government is saying that, you know, please have more babies. <laughs> but still, I think it's less than, you know, one. I think something like 0.9. It's still really low. And the second challenge is uh, aging population. Uh, as you know, you know, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, among the you know, oldest population uh, in the world. Uh, therefore, you know, working age population, I think already begun to decline. Uh, I think more serious in Japan, but same thing uh, for Korea. The third one, uh, you know, brain drain. Uh, young people uh, with a lot of talent, they continue to leave Korea uh, and don't come back. So, you know, assuming I have a brain and I can be case of brain drain because <laughs> I came here for graduate school then never returned to uh, Korea. So in terms of uh, human capital perspective, it's a really serious problem, right? You know, low birth rates, aging population, and brain drain. So what are you going to do, right? So we'll come back uh, more later, but so I just wanted to pose to you, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, there are two possibilities. One is more babies. So once again, you can, right? Force people to have more babies. Okay, the other one, uh, attracting or importing uh, foreign talent. I think Korea or Northeast Asia has a lot of problem in attracting uh, foreign talent or competing uh, for global talent, especially compared to North America, Australia, and other countries. So I think that's a, fa that's a situation that we are facing in Korea and Northeast Asia. Thank you, Professor Shin. Let me, let me maybe turn it now to Professor Wong to um, talk more specifically about these dynamics in the context of the semiconductor industry, um, especially drawing on your experience um, with, 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 with TMC, TSMC and educating um, you know, uh, students today um, here at Stanford. Well, in semiconductor in particular, uh, there, are, uh, there are two kinds of, uh, really to divide it up into two kinds of discussion. One is, in Asian countries like Taiwan and Korea and, and, and China, and the other one is in the US. Right? So the, the problem is slightly different. In many of the Asian countries, as Professor Shin has mentioned, all these forces of the global forces, such as a low birth rate, is having a big impact. Second is that in several of these Asian countries, specifically, let's say, Korea and Taiwan, the semiconductor industry has been so well developed that they have already attracted many of the STEM uh, science and technology and math uh, majors into semiconductors already. So because of the uh, well-developed semiconductor industry in Korea and in Taiwan. So the two forces added together uh, create a big talent crunch uh, because number one, the, so the pool of people is reduced, 
Number two, the, the industry is so well developed, the compensation for the talents are so well uh, paid in those local uh, environments so that they have already attracted most of the people that they, that's available. So the two forces added together create a, a tremendous talent crunch in those Asian countries. Mm -hmm. In the US, the situation is a little bit different. The population is way bigger. The denominator is big. Uh, however, the, there are many other industry in the US that attract the same STEM talents that have the same skill sets, science, engineering, math skills, generally speaking, to other industries. AI, <laughs> for example, uh, computer science, AI, and other fields, uh, even Wall Street, for example. Right? So the challenge in the US is a little bit different. A third aspect about the, uh, the US challenge is the vast expense of the geography. Um, some kind of the fabs are typically gain the best efficiency by co-locating uh, manufacturing plants, which typically are called fabs, in in the same vicinity because of the need for infrastructure such as suppliers and, uh, and material suppliers, equipment and manuf manufacturers to maintain the tools and so on. So to get economies of scale, you tend to concentrate the fabs in a one geographic location. So US is very big, you have 50 states and you cannot afford to spread out your fab among the 50 states to capitalize on the talents available locally. So in that sense, th so there are two parts of it now. For the higher skilled people in the US, mainly like PhD and above, and the lower skilled, relatively lower skilled people, MS, and bachelor's degree and below, those two are different because for the higher skilled people, you can ask them to move because a great career opportunity and many people are willing to move, let's say from Arkansas to California mm -hmm. or Minnesota to New York, right, for example. But for the lower skilled people, uh, the incentive to move to a particular location is very little. Uh, if I'm a, a community college trained technician, I'm living in Kansas City, you ask me to go to Oregon, give me a break, I, mean, I can find a better job locally here, right? So I think those challenges are there in the US that is not present in many of the Asian countries like Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea where the geography is more mm -hmm. concentrated and moving locally does not create a big uh, disruption. Mm. So I'll stop here and th there will be more color later. Yeah, yeah, so, so in a sense then, um, th you know, Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan have the advantage of um, a, a more concentrated, um, you, know, uh, in, you know, sort of industry, right? We, we saw yesterday uh, Rob Atkinson um, for those of you who missed it, um, he gave a presentation on Korea S and T policy, where one of the one of the, the the slide one of his data points showed the concentration of R and D um, as, as sort of a function of of how s spread across the, the economy it is. And in the case of Korea, for example, uh, much of that R and D spend is in just four companies, whereas you know in the U S. Um, it's 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 diversified, and and uh, the result being that, as, as as you indicated, you know, there's a lot more a lot more opportunities for people who want to do really interesting work to find that interesting work um, beyond you know semiconductors um, or, or a handful of sectors. Um, that's not the case in 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 in, in, in Korea, for example. Uh, but the country is smaller, so people can can move. Um, on the other hand, um, th this advantage is seems is attracting, um, tapping transnational mm -hmm. talent pools. And, and, and I know, Professor Shen, I mean, this, this, is, this, this transnational mm -hmm. piece is something that you, you've spent a lot of time researching and thinking about. Um, 
can you can you tell us? I mean, do you see differences in sectors mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to these these transnational talent flows? I mean, in other words, um, you know, uh, are certain uh, technology sectors, uh, semiconductors, for example, uh, different from uh, biopharma, um, or 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 is this a, a problem? That, that is sort of shared across industries in Asia? Right, so Korea has had a lot of uh, unskilled labor uh, from China and uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, they need more uh, sort of uh, skilled labor, especially uh, global talent so for semiconductor, you know, AI, uh, and other area. Uh, I think for Korea and Japan, it's not so much about size, but also culture. I think in my view, uh, culture is a main problem because uh, Koreans and Japanese, uh, they've been proud of being homogeneous nation you know, for a long time. And you know, there are more foreigners in Korea, but still uh, foreign population is only 4%. Okay, about 96% are ethnic Korean. <laughs> okay, still very homogeneous. And you know, I interview a lot of uh, foreign professionals coming to Korea. Uh, they are saying that, uh, let's say, you know, working at Samsung is not a problem, and they can talk to engineers uh, using English and maybe their technology language. But they are saying that it's very hard to live in Korea for a long time. You know, education is one thing, and they are not really being accepted. Uh, as part of Korean community, they are outsiders basically. Okay, so uh, you know some of them saying that uh, they love to work for Samsung, LG, SK uh, as a stepping stone uh, in moving toward other global companies. So I, I interviewed like you know, Indian uh, software engineers. They are saying that they don't mind spending three to five years in Korean company in Korea. But they like to come. They like to come to Silicon Valley or even go back to India. Okay, so uh, like uh, in Korea right now, more than hundred thousand uh, international students are coming to study in Korea, but most of them leave after you know graduation. In Japan, I think better because uh, Japan faced uh, the same problem much earlier. So I would say about uh, one third of international students are stay in Korea, uh, stay in Japan to work. Uh, most of them leave after three to five years. Okay, so I mean that's why uh, Korea and Japan, uh, probably Taiwan too. You know, they need to attract uh, foreign talent, but they don't really provide social cultural environment uh, for them to live with uh, local people. Okay, so I think that's a main challenge, and unless they are more open to uh, foreigners, foreign talent, and promote uh, diversity, it's very hard to compete. Okay, so uh, I can come back to this issue uh, later a little more because I have some uh, ideas how to improve on the situation. But I think that's a main challenge that Korea, Japan, probably Taiwan are facing, uh, especially in their competition for global talent uh, against more you know, immigrant society like uh, North America, Australia, uh, and so on, or Singapore. Yeah. Um, Professor Wong, one of the, the, the steps that, that Taiwan has taken to address the talent challenge um, is to, in, in a sense, kind of double down on uh, the Taiwanese workforce by creating, uh, in the case of semiconductors, uh, four um, semiconductor research uh, universities. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, you? So you you had some role in in um, inspiring that um, that uh, that just that, that move by the legislature. Could you give us a little bit of background on sort of how that came to be? Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, I was on leave at the, uh, from Stanford at TSMC for two years, and uh, at a time I. Uh, look into this human capital issues uh, for the company, and it turns out that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, companies like uh, TSMC has hired the majority of all uh, PhD students who graduated from the top universities in Taiwan. And that clearly cannot continue uh, for two reasons. One, the birth rate is coming down, so going forward, the um, available talent that the company could hire would decrease. Mm -hmm. 
And number two, company is growing. So one comes down, one goes up. So the situation is not going to improve. Uh, it's global dynamics that uh, you cannot do anything to improve it. And so that becomes an, a big issue. And uh, ESMC being one of the biggest companies in Taiwan, that situation flowed away all the way up to the president's office. And uh, she made a strong effort to put in uh, new legislation to unbundle the logistics of financing university research in within the local Taiwan universities. Uh, uh, the all the professors in Taiwan in universities in, in properly funded universities in Taiwan follow a government pay scale, which is very limiting. And uh, so they uh, put in legislation to allow them to unbundle uh, the salary and, uh, and compensation for a selected left set of people who specifically work on semiconductors and also allow them to hire more students because it, not only their salary, but also the number <coughs> of students that the universities can admit into <coughs> programs that are related Gen broadly speaking, uh, chemistry materials and so on and so forth, that they could admit to a certain major is also limited uh, very strictly uh, from, from this uh, Ministry of Education. So they put in legislation to kind of unbundle that uh, to allow them to grow the number of places that they could uh, have students for in the field of semiconductor. So that's what they're doing now. So they established four semiconductor colleges within the university system that are somewhat separate from the university system, but they're still part of the university. Um, so that's what they have done. Um, the other aspects of what they have been trying to do with semiconductor colleges is in recognition of the fact that the US and the Western world still lead in many of the advanced R&D which is the source of innovation for future products. And the semiconductor industry in Taiwan for the past maybe 30 some years have mostly been uh, in catch up mode. Namely the US has been, the Western world has been leading in technology and only in the past, very recent past have they kind of surpassed the rest of the world and became a technology leader. So they recognize that to have, to, con to maintain that leadership, they need to do their own R&D, not to just follow everybody else. And that's where part of the initiative from the government and also from companies that are locally is to grow the R&D capability. And to know that the best way to grow is to learn from whoever is doing it the best, namely from the US and the Western world. So part of that is to, of the semiconductor colleges, is to encourage the professors and universities there to collaborate with the Western world. And that's still a work in progress right now uh, as far as how to do that, uh, given this current situation of a big chill in international collaboration put on by, let's say, the China Initiative, as you mentioned earlier, that is still a challenge today. Um, So I, 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 compensation is obviously important, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's that, I mean, that, that let's, let's not, you But know. it's not everything. Otherwise, it's not there everything. would be no professor. Yeah, yeah and, and so, yeah, no. I, and so I, I, I want to I I come back to Professor Shin's um, comments about um, the, the cultural, sort of the, 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 um, the fact that people don't stay and ask, um, you know, you, you, how does, I mean, how should, so there's a new administration in Korea, for example, um, how should the government think about that problem? I mean, are there, are there policy instruments? Are there things that companies could do um, based on your research to help um, address that? I mean, because clearly paying them more, yeah, I mean, you know, you'll, yeah. some would stay, but at the end of the day, if, it, you know, if that's, the difference between people staying three to five years versus really building a life, how do, how do you, how do you, what are the options for, 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 for mirroring that? Uh, 
I think that's why it's a difficult issue because uh, you know culture doesn't change very quickly. They change you know, very slowly, you know, over time. And uh, one thing is uh, they should teach more about you know value of diversity, uh, like in college, for example. And I look at uh, curriculum uh, in current universities and compared to like Stanford, right? Uh, there are very few uh, courses to teach on on diversity. And also, I think in the minds of, uh, I'm, I'm working on this article, but I think in the minds of uh, a lot of Korean people, okay, diversity means they're like, um, sort of you know, considering uh, the weak or the handicapped or, mm -hmm. okay? But they don't understand that how diversity can promote innovation. I mean, here uh, in Silicon Valley, we all believe that diversity is crucial to innovation. I don't think that's in the mindset of Korean people. You know, diversity means, yeah, sure, I mean, we can maybe accommodate uh, some, you know, people, like unfortunate or weak people, right? But, so, I mean, that's one thing. So, how you can bring more people with diverse background and trying to promote, you know, promote innovation, I mean, that really has to be in the minds of uh, Korean leaders and policy makers. And the other one, uh, in terms of R&D, uh, such an R&D, uh, do you know which country spend the most R&D per capita in the world? Korea. Korea. Yeah. Number two? Japan, right? So then why then they not really so effective, right, uh, in spending R&D? So let me give you one example. I don't want to make it only bad <laughs> comments on Korea, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so some years ago, I was serving an international uh, advisory board for Korea Foundation Research. Uh, it's like a uh, Korean version of you know, NSF, okay? And they had about a dozen of uh, international people to advise on the foundation. And that's why I knew that, I didn't know that until then, Korea is spending so much money on R&D, and you know, per capita number one in the world by far. And then I was wondering then why then it wasn't really, you know, producing, uh, you know, great outcomes, okay? And at least based on my own uh, experience, I don't know whether I can generalize. Uh, one is that the Ministry of Education, they're controlling, okay? So there's a president and, you know, program officer and other people, but then the director level of, uh, you, know, you know, bureaucrats, uh, from the Ministry of Education, they're controlling, okay? So we are making a lot of good suggestions, but then unless they, you know, you know buy, right, those arguments, it's not gonna happen. And then yeah, most of those, um, and they're really domestically trained. <laughs> so, so we gave a lot of ideas, but none of them really was accepted. So after a couple of years, I said, uh, what's the point of having this committee? I mean, you spend lots of money and we are spending our time, so let's forget it. So I think that's why, uh, in a sense, you know, government is trying very hard to promote R&D. Unless they change their mindset, uh, just spending money alone is not going to uh, change either, okay? So that's why I like to make two points, one is culture, the other one, sort of in a mindset among you know, policymakers. So it's not that Korea is not trying, they are trying very hard, but then they can do much better than what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. How, so, so as, you, as you said, changing culture is, right. is hard. Um, and that, that, that's a, a generations long endeavor, um, whereas, you know, the, the, the in semiconductors, you know, the product cycle is, you know, much, much shorter. How, so, so on, on the, the R&D front, um, that seems more amenable to near-term results, even if there are still some, some institutional factors, institutional cultural factors that have to, have to get worked out. Um, in, in, in Taiwan, um, is, is, so, so the, there's these, these, you know, four new colleges where the compensation structure for faculty uh, and the ability to attract students, um, you know, is is uh, you know stronger. Um, how how successful do you think that model will be? I mean, as as someone who 
you know, I mean, has, has been in, in academia and, has, you know, uh, trained the next generation, you know, uh, what, what, is your, what is your outlook on, on that, um, that endeavor? Yeah, I'm glad you brought, brought it up. I think this is something that is, that has to be addressed on a global level um, because, as I mentioned earlier, Taiwan already attracted many of the available STEM students into the field, mm -hmm. right? So the best thing they can do is to up their game and increase their capability to do better innovations, better R&D than before, now, rather than looking at what other people have done and replicating that, which is what they have been doing in the past 20, 20 30 years, but they, we also recognize that this is not viable going forward. So they need to, they need to up their game. So with their existing people, they need to up their game. Now in the US, there is a great source of people in the US who, that do wonderful R&D, but we are losing them to other industries, even though we've trained them. Mm -hmm. right. so the US has a great advantage because it is a great attractor for the best talent from around the world. We also have the social, cultural advantage in being, because we're English speaking, most people who do science and engineering do speak English, and, they, and we are a very open and welcoming society, so we don't have any assimilation problems. Let's say people who go to Korea or who don't speak Korean or go to Taiwan, don't speak Chinese, couldn't really survive very well. Most people who do science and engineering around the world do speak English and they can survive reasonably well in the US. So the US is a great attractor for talent globally for R&D. And that's where I think the global collaboration would really help because the US needs to increase their capability to do R&D. Not only that, they need to increase the capability to translate the R&D into actual products. Mm -hmm. Because now that, that comes about the, the need to do more of the manufacturing in the US. Because you do R&D, but if you don't have any manufacturing, you don't know where the actual problems are. And so you may be coming up with pie in the sky that is not viable. Wonderful R&D, great idea, but not practical. So you need to have uh, simultaneously the capability to, to manufacture. You need to have the proper infrastructure to translate, to help lower the barrier from R&D to and translating that to manufacture. And that's something that the US can take the lead and also in collaboration with other countries. Because these people who get trained in this field will may stay in the US, which is great, and they may go back to their home country. And that would be the reverse flow of talent mm -hmm. that could benefit the entire industry. And semiconductor being the foundational technology for many of the things we do, including AI and everything, climate change, everything that we do, need to do, count on computing and information technology that is based on semiconductor chip, it's good for everybody. So that's a key role that the, the US can play and take a lead with other countries around the world. So I want to maybe take a step back. Um, Professor Shin, I mean, you, you, you've studied this problem over the course you know, of, 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 of you know, going decades, right? And so you, you have a historical perspective on this as well. Um, what, what, what are some of the, the trend lines um, that, that have jumped out at you in your research around innovation talent flows? Um, are they, uh, are, are the trends, are there discon discontinuities that you've observed? Um, any, any lessons that policymakers may be able to draw from that history? Right, so in my current project, uh, I'm comparing uh, you know, four countries, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, China, and India. So let me mention about China and India because uh, these are very interesting cases because uh, so initially I thought uh, China and India are very similar. They're both a big country in population. They had a huge brain drain initially because a lot of people left China and India uh, for education or you know, you know, work experience like uh, here. But then uh, if you look at uh, you know, China and, and India closely, they are very different actually. Uh, 
Well, in case of Chinese, a lot of them went back. Okay, after education or uh, working experience, what they call brain circulation. Okay, so that uh, when they went back to China, then they also creating new companies, you know, similar to what you know they learned in the United States. So in a sense, of competing, right? <laughs> but if you look at uh, Indians, that's a really interesting case because uh, a lot of Indians. They don't go back. Okay, if you look at in Silicon Valley, yeah, they are uh, really at the top level. I mean, like uh, Sundar Pichai of Google, you know, Microsoft, and you know, many companies, and you know, many of them actually came to U.S. after college, and then they are really high uh, high up, and they don't go back, but then they are working with India very closely. Okay, so. I think that's what I call you know, social capital or transnational you know, social capital. So in, in other words, in terms of human capital, you know, India is losing a lot. We really don't go back. But in terms of uh, transnational social capital, India is really at, at advantage. Mm. And because of that, at least so far, India and US don't have any tension. They are supplementary, okay? so. Like uh, Sundar Pichai of Google, they can work with the uh, Indians in India um, for benefits of both countries. Whereas China is more in competition with the United States. Okay, so that's geopolitics, kind of one of your theme. Okay, so uh, I think down the road, you know, this is my speculation that you know India will have a lot of advantage because they have a lot of talent in this area. Like Silicon Valley is you know, a good example. And they are working with Indians. Uh, so, like, uh, you are going back to Thai. I guess you're not going I'm back from to Hong China. Kong. <laughs> you're from Hong Kong, right? So, maybe it's a case of brain drain, but then you are making contribution to Taiwan, Hong Kong, because we have a lot of social capital, even though you are working here. You are living here, right? And then also, you know, I can get uh, small credit uh, for this conference because I connect Andrew to Korea Foundation because I know both of them. That's my social capital as well, right? So I think uh, that's why you know, my thinking is that we should go beyond human capital. Okay, social capital is very important, especially in global age. And it has a lot of uh, implication for Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Because as I mentioned, uh, it's very hard to attract uh, foreign talent. Okay, they may come back, uh, they may come to Korea, but they're gonna leave after a few years. So in terms of a human capital, it's a loss. But it doesn't have to be lost in terms of social capital, okay? So if they build uh, social capital in Korea, and after leaving Korea, whether coming to US or Taiwan or the other country, they can connect, they can bridge. So that's uh, social capital. So, so my argument has been that uh, some people are saying, well, you know, Korea, Japan has to embrace migration, okay? You know, addressing the challenge I mentioned earlier, but then it's very difficult, right? Because of the culture in other regions. So then, you know, my argument is that, you know, Korea or Japan is not ready for migration now, at least for maybe next 10 years. Then what are you gonna do? You need foreign talent. You know, migration is not the answer. So my argument is that bring them to Korea. Because they love to come, at least for a few years for experience. Let them go, that's fine. But make sure that they got a good experience and you know, help them to build a network so after leaving Korea, they can still stay in, you know, connected with Korea. Okay, that will be very useful uh, for Korea, Japan, and other countries. So in a sense, you know, many of us are connecting uh, US to home countries. We are making great contribution in terms of social capital, if not human capital. So I think that's something uh, we have taken more seriously. I think India is a great example. I mean, it's amazing how many Indians successful entrepreneurs uh, in this area, how much they're working with uh, their home country. I think in that sense, India has a lot of uh, promise in my view, yeah. Can you maybe elaborate a little more on what you mean by social capital? Yeah. Well, social capital basically means uh, you know, networks and ties, mm. okay? So it can be uh, bonding social capital, okay? So in other words, uh, with my friends, okay, I can have a uh, bonding Capital, right? Yeah, networks and ties. But I can make a local bridge, right? I mean, so let's say, where do you go for your college? 
Uh, University of Kentucky. Yeah, Kentucky and Stanford, you can maybe bridge between Kentucky and mm -hmm. uh, Silicon Valley, right? That's yeah. what you call local bridging capital, mm -hmm. or local bridging social capital. Yeah, what I'm saying is it can be transnational, okay, beyond the local area uh, between countries. And then, so when you have your social capital, then people, it's easy to have some transaction or business because uh, you trust people, right? So maybe when I uh, talk to you and Korea Foundation, I hope that you trust me, right? <laughs> 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 right? So I mean, in, in business, right? I mean, you know, yeah. if you know people you can trust, then it's much easier for transaction and business you know, than you know, between unknown. Absolutely. So that's why I call it transnational social capital. Mm -hmm. And I think it's becoming more and more important uh, with the globalization. Well, yeah, and, and I, I think the the past uh, six years have been s really hard on, on China yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. Um, given all of the, 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 the tension and yeah. friction um, that, that's emerged uh, between, the, between the United States and, and China in particular. Um, well, I, we have about 15 minutes left. I would love uh, to spend the last uh, period of time um, hearing your questions. Um, I have lots of questions still, but I want to open the floor up and, and see if, if, if anybody has a comment or question. Please. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, and I think the issues we are discussing are very difficult. Uh, I come from Estonia, the issue of how to increase population, uh, how, or how you put it, how to have more babies, um, is definitely something the, um, the government has been dealing with um, very seriously. Because similarly to what you described, the numbers were going down and it was not looking good. Estonia is a small nation with 1.3, so it's not even only about workforce, it's you know a bigger question of what will be our nation right. in, in hundreds of years, right? So, um, so Estonia has taken this issue very seriously and there are a series of uh, different policies of how to incentivize uh, young people uh, to create a family, to have kids, not yeah. only, what did you say for Korea, 0 0.7, 0 0.9 is the average? 0 0.9, yeah. Le less than one, yeah. So, you raised this as, as one of the one of the challenges, and also the other panelists. But but what are the uh, strategies for Korea to tackle this? You you were kind of alluding to saying that we can't force people to have babies, and you know let's move to other options. But what are the policies that could help this? Um, yesterday at the dinner, um, I was talking to uh, young Koreans about their choices, and one of the issues was cost cost of raising children. Uh, opportunities for women to actually take part in workforce, opportunities to women to actually actively raise their children and have a career, um, possibilities for involving more fathers mm -hmm. in raising children. Um, so Estonia has lots of these options. It's very flexible to, to have kind of both worlds, a family and a career. Uh, but this is because of specific government policies. Uh, for example, flexible maternity leave that you can change the way you want, the way that is comfortable for you, ensuring that your um, job is guaranteed for three years after having a baby. You know, these things. Uh, just just what, is, what does your research show um, about um, the government's position in oh. this? Is this something they would like to pursue or would they rather prefer other options in, in solving this? So thank you very much. Why? I think that's a uh, you know, good question, and uh, I think that's uh, the problem because uh, Korean government is spending a lot of money, I mean, lots of money, billions of dollars every year, okay? And then if a baby, if you send daycare, then government will pay, you know, for your daycare service. I think lately, if you have a baby, then they'll p give you some money, right? I mean. So I was talking to my wife, we got three children, oh. shit, you know, we have, <laughs> <laughs> maybe in Korea. <laughs> so, you know, they're doing all they can do financially, but still doesn't really change, you know, the rate declining, not going up, right? So that's why money doesn't solve the problem. Uh, the main reason, once again, I think still uh, raising, uh, you, know, you know, children may be very expensive. 
And also maybe culture, because uh, I have three children, as I mentioned. My the first daughter is now 31. And they may or may not marry. And then they're not sure that they want to have any baby. So it's in, in this country, right? So I mean, even here without immigration, uh, you know, you know, birth rate will go down, then you know, population will be aging as well. So I mean, that's why, sure, you know, you should support uh, young people. I have no problem with that, but it may not solve the fundamental problem. So that's why I try to change their mindset. So my argument is fairly provocative. It's not a conventional argument, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you know, one example, like you know, Australia. Okay, so. Uh, you, know, you know, sure, you know, you know, it's an immigrant country. But then, you know, until 1970s, they pursued, you know, white Australia. They wouldn't you know, accept non-white immigrants, like Chinese or Asian, right? It's basically UK and then some white from, you know, European country. But then the population is declining, right? And they couldn't even, you know, fill all those uh, positions. So that's why they open up, you know, giving up, you know, white, you know, Australia, then become more multicultural. So now, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Australia, you know, there is much a difference between domestic and foreign talent in terms of job compensation. Uh, you know, it's very easy to get a job after graduation in Australia. Uh, they are very friendly to, you know, foreigners and so on. So, I mean, that's why coming back to culture. So. When I mention Australia, well, it's an immigrant country, but if you look at you know, their history, the white Australia, they are very exclusive. But once they open up now, you know, Australia among the wealthiest countries in the world. I mean, their GDP is like top 15 uh, with only like 30 million people, right? So, I mean, that's why we really have to rethink our conventional wisdom, and then what are you gonna do? How are you gonna uh, bring more human capital, social capital, uh, and also uh, innovation. So, I, you, know, you know, back to Australia, one more thing. Uh, right now, uh, okay, a lot of people came to Australia and work, but also, you know, many left after education. So there are about, uh, I think about 3 million or 2.5 million alumni. So about 10% of Australian uh, population. So now Australian government is trying to organize alumni. Okay, so it's not by university, by school, but then by the government. So global alumni strategy, and actually a lot of uh, European countries now following Australia that strategy actually. So they are trying to capitalize on their uh, transnational social capital. So by the government, it's not just by company, by the Australian government. So. Uh, I think Australia might be one uh, good example to look at. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador. Hi. Professor Shin, it's nice to meet you here again. Um, I have a comment and questions. Um, when I uh, was engaged uh, in the negotiation with the United States on uh, free trade agreement, uh, we uh, initially planned to uh, how to liberalize our ed educational market. Actually, that was the uh, initial intention of the government officials to upgrade our education, uh, the degree of our education. But uh, we uh, faced uh, with uh, a very strong resistance uh, from stakeholders. Teachers did not like to open the market. And parents, particularly parents from uh, low-income families, did not uh, like to open the markets uh, as well. Therefore, we, we uh, failed to uh, open educational market and services uh, to the United States. Actually, that was a very difficult uh, experience for me. Um, actually, uh, reform by itself is very difficult. And uh, we found that actually, uh, if we would have um, better educational opportunity through uh, opening our market, then that, that would be also another way to go but that it didn't, didn't work either. That is uh, just a comment of my experience. And then question to uh, Professor Shin. Um, Chinese students, uh, actually after uh, having a higher study in the United States and coming back to China, 
And China has a lot of resources to uh, scout actually high talented actually foreign experts. And they, they just hire them uh, in China. And under that situation, how do you see the innovation potential of China in the future in the critical technologies? Right, so uh, as you know, Chinese government uh, has been implementing a lot of talent programs. I mean, thousand talent programs is one example, but there's, there's tons of programs at central local level. And now they start advertising <laughs> because of uh, you know, their tensions. And you know, my view, I mean, you may correct me, my view is that China was able to grow and innovate because they were open to global market, especially uh, United States. But in recent years, they are closing. Okay, they are becoming more inward looking. I think that's what happened in Japan. And I think my view, I mean, Japan always valued homegrown talent. But still, like uh, 70s and 80s, they were more actively collaborating with, uh, you know, in a global you know, market. But uh, from 90s, they are more inward looking. And I think that's one big factor uh, for depression or last decades uh, in Japan. So my sense with the Xi Jinping uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in regime and looks like China is more closing. And I met uh, many, I guess this is maybe on, <laughs> on the video, but, <laughs> but I know some uh, Chinese friends, uh, very wealthy, successful entrepreneurs. Uh, they, they moved their family here in Palo Alto, okay? And then they sort of commute. And then when I talk to them, many of them saying that they are really pessimistic about the future, okay, at least for the next 10 years, because it's really closing down, and it's very hard to do business uh, in China. So, uh, yeah, sure, I mean, China may, I mean, you know, may be big enough to uh, do their own innovation, but uh, without really, really, you know, active uh, collaboration with uh, global players, especially the United States. I'm not sure how far they can go. And then now, as you know, the economy and you know, security are being linked. And maybe decoupling may happen, especially in high-tech area between US and China. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm more pessimistic about the future of China, uh, especially compared to India. But uh, that's my own view in terms of uh, talent flow perspective. Uh, thank you for your remarks. This question may be a little more... Uh, please introduce yourself. Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> My name is Tracy Navichoka, and I'm the program manager for the Global Digital Policy Incubator at the Cyber Policy Center. And my question may be a little more abstract, but I was curious, Professor Shin, about your comments on social capital and trust and sort of how that is necessary for human capital attraction and for a stable workforce. And it seems to me that hardware and digital services, they it's like a trustworthy industry or dependable and you have these uh, players that engage in trade deals, but this industry undergirds the digital ecosystem, which is now rife with mistrust and misinformation. So I'm just curious about the discrepancy between both. How is one dependable and then the other, uh, it's sort of fueling, a trustworthy place is fueling something that is spreading uh, an erosion of trust. So I know that's a bit abstract, but I don't know if it, <laughs> Uh, have you, what are what are like markers of dependability in the industry that could be translated to our digital services um, of, of engagement? You may have some thought <laughs> um, in, in, in actual industry. Yeah. Well, certainly you know, trust is very important in industry. Right? Uh, how you trust your uh, trust your customers, your supplier, your partners, uh, trust is very important. And so, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Well, it seems like, I mean, on some level, to the extent that, um, that, that a workforce is drawn to an industry that is perceived as, um, you know, uh, doing good, um, that could, so I'll use an analogy, right? So, um, you know, in the 1990s, Philip Morris, probably had a hard time recruiting, you know, cigarette manufacturer, mm -hmm. had a hard time recruiting the top, you know, management and scientific talent because the product, cigarettes, mm -hmm. 
were controversial and clouded in, you know, um, you know, in 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 problems. And you know, it seems like, uh, you know, I, 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 it's probably too early to know, and I doubt, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and you know, the social media platforms would sh- would actually share this data. But, you know, I mean, th- th- their 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 sheen has taken a bit of a scuff, mm-hmm. right? And you know, I, whether that translates to challenges recruiting and retaining mm-hmm. uh, employees compared to other sectors. Um, is a big question. I think, um, I mean, Professor Wong and I have talked about, you know, uh, challenges in the semiconductor industry where um, I think, you know, I'd welcome your, 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 your thoughts and elaborations on this, but I mean, par- part of the problem is that, um, you, know, stup- you know, young people can get in front of a keyboard and start like coding and develop apps and, you know, tinker and, and experiment. Whereas with semiconductors, I mean, you know, a 15-year-old high school student can't exactly go out and, you know, uh, I mean, the design tools, you know, cost hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, uh, unlike, you know, just getting a, you know, you know, a, a, a simple Python. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a different, uh, the compensation structure is different, um, and a lot of it has to do with just the, the call it the, the sexiness of semiconductors compared to, you know, the next killer app. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I think you're onto something. Um, and I would love to know more about how, to the extent to which, you know, some of the, 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 the again, the sort of the scuff and the sheen of social media has had an impact on the recruiting and retention. But it seems like it's got to be a factor. Yeah, I'm going to just expand on that, uh, on the trust part of it, and uh, just maybe mentioning about companies like uh, foundries like TSMC. Mm-hmm. Their, uh, their main business model is customer trust. Mm-hmm. They need different customers can come to the same company, different customers who are competitors can come to the same company and order the same kinds of technologies and they go and compete among themselves and not worry about, I'm g- are you gonna leak my information to my competitors? So this customer trust takes a long time to establish and takes a lot of effort to ensure transparency so that everybody believes that you can trust them. And that's very important. It's not just the technology, it's this kind of cultural or social dimension that makes the business work, right? So that's kind of on the trust part. On the part about um, the lowering the barrier for young people, the students to come and learn about a very important foundational technology. I think there are two dimensions. One is the semiconductor industry has a marketing problem. It is a foundational technology that the entire society depends on today. Not only that, but the entire society counts on for tomorrow for all the advances that we want. We want self-driving cars. We want AI systems that work. We want language uh, models that really are can be trained with high energy efficiency. They all depend on semiconductors. At the same time, young people don't recognize that when they're doing TikTok or whatever. They're counting on semiconductors. Without semiconductors, none of them work. And so we have a, well, we meaning the semiconductor industry has a marketing problem. They see things as sexy, so to speak, uh, in things that they can see and touch. When they take a cell phone and do all this stuff, they couldn't touch the chip. They don't Mm. see the chip. They don't even, even if you give them a chip, they don't see what's inside. (laughs) (laughs) It's so small. (laughs) So, So we have a marketing problem, and even for a very important foundational technology, and when we talk in society today, in government and so on, we talk about new technology. We always say, oh, AI, quantum computing, biopharma. We never said semiconductors. <laughs> but all these things depend on semiconductors. You, you find out how to, uh, the, the protein with talk with the, uh, with the virus, you do computation. And what do you do computation with? A computer. And what do you build a computer with? With chips. Yeah. So th- we don't recognize this very important basic thing. Mm-hmm. And that's very important. That's one is to 
for society to recognize the foundational nature of this technology. Right? It, everybody, everything counts on that. That's number one. Number two is to lower the barrier. Okay, now let's say I recognize the importance. I want to be part of it. I want to save the world, so to speak. Well, all the Stanford students want to save the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to make an impact to the world. How do I do that? Well, I don't know because I couldn't design things. I couldn't figure out how to build a chip because the barriers is so high. Mm -hmm. uh, high. Like you said, a high school student can get on a $200 computer and write their own code and maybe put it out on the, on the app store and get some money out of it, right? But it cannot be done for semiconductors. Mm -hmm. So as educators, we need to figure out a way, pedagogical ways, do research on lowering the barrier. Lowering the barrier is a research topic in and of itself, mm -hmm. and we haven't done that yet. How do we lower the barrier? How do you make a, well, today I take the students into the Stanford fabric fabrication facilities and show them how to make the chip. That's a huge expense going to do that and huge know-how, and I got to have like three grad students working with me to prepare the thing and so on and so forth. How do you make it simpler? How do you make it easier? Mm. And that's a research in and of itself. And that's something that I think the entire community could focus on. And that's why I say when I, when I say the US could be the R&D center of the world and have this talent flow, right? We train all the students. Mm -hmm. they, some of them may stay in the US, some of them may flow back to their home country and they will grow the industry from their own country. And, and that's how, and if you look at Many of the technology leaders in within, let's say, in Taiwan, Taiwan yeah. many of them are trained in the U.S. Yeah, you true, true. Just go into the website and check out the executive yeah. of the TSMC, and half of them were trained in the U.S., or maybe even more than half of them. Mm. And so we should be, the we meaning the U.S., should be the R&D center of the world and come up with ways to train and create opportunities for young people to come into this really foundational technology. Well, that th that seems like a fitting way to wrap up um, our panel. We are we are we are at our time. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Shin and Professor Wong uh, for sharing their their insights and wisdom. Uh, fascinating conversation, and, and and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And I am also uh, going to bring our uh, conference to a close. I want to thank all of you uh, for spending the last day and a half with us. Uh, for those of you uh, joining via Zoom or live stream, uh, thank you uh, for tuning in. Um, the sessions are all uh, memorialized um, on, uh, so you, you should be able to watch them. If you missed, if you happen to miss a session, uh, you can go back and watch it. Um, and um, with that, um, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I want to add one last point. Sorry, this this is this is an important one. Um, I, I want to thank Professor Lee uh, uh, and the and the Korea Foundation team uh, for, the, for their support. Um, this has been a wonderful experience for me. I hope for for you and the participants as well. And um, I'm I'm very I'm very grateful for it. Good job. Yeah.